The Poetry of Nature by Charles George Douglas Roberts From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lian Yao Jason in Panama Sonia Thomas Peter and Craig Franklin. When Keats wrote, the poetry of earth is never dead, he enunciated a truth which the world of his own day was hardly ready to accept in its fullness. Today, none would seriously question it. Regarded subjectively, the poetry of earth, or in other words, the quality which makes for poetry an external nature, is that power in nature which moves us by suggestion which excites in us emotion, imagination, or poignant association, which plays upon the tense strings of our sympathies with the fingers of memory or desire. This power may reside not less in a bleak pasture lot than in a paradisal close of bloom and verdure, not less in the roadside thistle patch than in a peak that soars into the sunset. It works through sheer beauty or sheer sublimity, but it may work with equal effect through austerity or reticence or limitation or change. It may use the most common scenes, the most familiar facts and forms, as the vehicle of its most penetrating and most illuminating message. It is apt to make the drop of dew on a grass glade as significant as the starred concave of the sky. The poetry of nature by which I mean this poetry of earth expressed in words, may be roughly divided into two main classes, that which deals with mere description, and that which treats of nature, in some, one of its many relations with humanity. The latter class is that which alone was contemplated in Keats's line. It has many subdivisions, it includes much of the greatest poetry that the world has known, and there is little verse of acknowledged mastery, that does not depend upon it for some portion of its appeal. The former class has but a slender claim to recognition as poetry, under any definition of poetry that does not make metrical form the prime essential. The failures of the wisest to enunciate a satisfactory definition of poetry make it almost presumptuous for a critic now to attempt the task. But from an analysis of these failures, one may adduce something roughly to serve the purpose. To say that poetry is the metrical expression in words of thought fused in emotion is of course incomplete, but it has the advantage of defining. No one can think that anything other than poetry is intended by such a definition, and nothing is excluded that can show a clear claim to admittance. But the poetry of mere enumerative description might perhaps not pass without a challenge, so faint is the flame of its emotion, so imperfect the fusion of its thought. It is verse of this sort that is meant by undiscriminating critics when they inveigh against nature poetry, and declare that the only poetry worth man's attention is that which has to do with the heart of man. Merely descriptive poetry is not very far removed from the work of the reporter and the photographer. Lacking the selective quality of creative art, it is in reality little more than a representation of some of the raw materials of poetry. It leaves the reader unmoved, because little emotion has gone to its making. Poetry of this sort, at its best, is to be found abundantly in Thompson's Seasons. At less than its best it concerns no one. Nature becomes significant to man when she is passed through the alembic of his heart. Irrelevant and confusing details have been purged away. What remains is single and vital. It acts either by interpreting, recalling, suggesting, or symbolizing some phase of human feeling. Out of the fusing heat born of this contact comes the perfect line, luminous, unforgettable, with something of mystery in its beauty that eludes analysis. Whatever it be that is brought to the alembic, naked hill or barren sand reach sea or meadow weed or star it comes out charged with a new force 
imperishable and active wherever it finds sympathies to vibrate under its currents in the imperishable verse of ancient greece and rome nature poetry of the higher class is generally supposed to play but a small part in reality it is nearly always present nearly always active in that verse but it appears in such a disguise that its origin is apt to be overlooked the greeks and the romans of course following their pattern personified the phenomena of nature till these for all purposes of art became human the greeks made their anthropomorphic gods of the forces of nature which compelled their adoration of these personifications they sang as of men of like passions with themselves but in truth it was of external nature that they made their songs bion's wailing lament for adonis human as it is throughout is in its final analysis a poem of nature by an intense but perhaps unconscious subjective process the ancients supplied external nature with their own moods impulses and passions the transitions from the ancient to the modern fashion of looking at nature are to be found principally in the work of the celtic bards who rather than the cloistered students of that time kept alive the true fire of poetry through the long darkness of the middle ages the modern attitude toward nature as distinguished from that of the greeks begins to show itself clearly in english song very soon after the great revivifying movement which we call the renaissance at first it is a very simple matter indeed men sing of nature because nature is impressing them directly a joyous season calls forth a joyous song summa isi cumenin lude sing cuckoo groweth seed and bloweth mead and springs the wood anew this is the poet's answering hail when the springtime calls to his blood with the fall of the leaf his singing has a sombre and foreboding note and winter in the world makes winter in his song this is nature poetry in its simplest form the form which it chiefly took with the spontaneous elizabethans but it soon became more complex as life and society became entangled in more complex conditions the artificialities of the queen anne period delayed this evolution but with gray and collins we see it fairly in process man looking upon external nature projects himself into her workings his own wrath he apprehends in the violence of the storm his own joy in the loveliness of opening blossoms his own mirth in the light waves running in the sun his own gloom in the heaviness of the rain and wind in all nature he finds but phenomena of himself she becomes but an expression of his hopes his fears his cravings his despair this intense subjectivity is peculiarly characteristic of the nature poetry produced by byron and his school when that titan of modern song apostrophizes the storm thundering over jura he speaks to the tumult in the deeps of his own soul when he addresses the stainless tranquillities of clear placid le mans what moves him to utterance is the contemplation of such a calm as his vexed spirit often craved when man's heart and the heart of nature had become thus closely involved the relationship between them and consequently the manner of its expression in song became complex almost beyond the possibilities of analysis wordsworth's best poetry is to be found in the utterances of the high priest in nature's temple interpreting the mysteries the function of the lines composed a few miles above tintern abbey is to convey to a restless age troubled with small cares seen in too close perspective the large contemplative wisdom which seemed to wordsworth the message of the scene which moved him keats his soul aflame with the worship of beauty was impassioned toward the manifestations of beauty in the world about him and at the same time he used these freely as symbols to express other aspects of the same compelling spirit shelley the most complex of the group sometimes combined all these methods as in the ode to the west wind but he added a new note which was yet an echo of the oldest the note of nature worship 
he saw continually in nature the godhead which he sought and adored youthful protestations and affectations of atheism to the contrary notwithstanding most of shelley's nature poetry carries a rich vein of pantheism allied to that which colors the oldest verse of time and particularly characterizes ancient celtic song with this significant and stimulating revival goes a revival of that strong sense of kinship of the oneness of earth and man which the greeks and latins felt so keenly at times which omar knew and uttered and which underlies so much of the verse of these later days that other unity the unity of man and god which forms so inevitable a corollary to the pantheistic proposition comes to be dwelt upon more and more insistently throughout the nature poetry of the last fifty years the main purpose of these brief suggestions is to call attention to the fact that nature poetry is not mere description of landscape in metrical form but the expression of one or another of many vital relationships between external nature and the deep heart of man it may touch the subtlest chords of human emotion and human imagination not less masterfully than the verse which sets out to be a direct transcript from life the most inaccessible truths are apt to be reached by indirection the divinest mysteries of beauty are not possessed exclusively by the eye that loves or by the lips of a child but are also manifested in some bird song's unforgotten cadence some flower whose perfection pierces the heart some ineffable hue of sunset or sunrise that makes the spirit cry out for it knows not what and whosoever follows the inexplicable lure of beauty in colour form sound perfume or any other manifestation reaching out to it as perhaps a message from some unfathomable past or a premonition of the future knows that the mystic signal beckons nowhere more imperiously than from the heights of nature poetry charles g d roberts end of the poetry of nature by charles george douglas roberts The World is Too Much With Us by William Wordsworth From The World's Best Poetry Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The World is Too Much With Us Sonnet The world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon. The winds that will be howling at all hours, And are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune, It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan Suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, Standing on this pleasant lea, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Earth, ocean. Air. From Alaster, Preface. By Percy Bysshe Shelley. From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao. Earth, Ocean, Air. Nondum amabam, et amare amabam, quiribam quid amarum, amans amare. Confessions of St. Augustine Earth, ocean, air, beloved brotherhood, If our great mother has imbued my soul With aught of natural piety to feel your love, And recompense the boon with mine, If dewy morn, and odorous noon, and even, With sunset and its gorgeous ministers, And solemn midnight's tingling silentness, 
if autumn's hollow sighs in the sere wood and winter robing with pure snow and crowns of starry ice the grey grass and bare boughs if spring's voluptuous pantings when she breathes her first sweet kisses have been dear to me if no bright bird insect or gentle beast i consciously have injured but still loved and cherished these my kindred then forgive this boast beloved brethren and withdraw no portion of your wonted favour now mother of this unfathomable world favour my solemn song for i have loved thee ever and thee only i have watched thy shadow and the darkness of thy steps and my heart ever gazes on the depth of thy deep mysteries i have made my bed in charnels and on coffins where black death keeps record of the trophies won from thee hoping to still these obstinate questionings of thee and thine by forcing some lone ghost thy messenger to render up the tale of what we are in lone and silent hours when night makes a weird sound of its own stillness like an inspired and desperate alchemist staking his very life on some dark hope have i mixed awful talk and asking looks with my most innocent love until strange tears uniting with those breathless kisses made such magic as compels the charmed knight to render up thy charge and though ne'er yet thou hast unveiled thy inmost sanctuary enough from incommunicable dream and twilight phantasms and deep noonday thought has shone within me that serenely now and moveless as a long-forgotten lyre suspended in the solitary dome of some mysterious and deserted fame i wait thy breath great parent that my strain may modulate with murmurs of the air and motions of the forest and the sea and voice of living beings and woven hymns of night and day and the deep heart of man End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On a Beautiful Day by John Sterling From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia On a Beautiful Day O oh, unseen spirit, now a calm divine comes forth from thee rejoicing earth and air trees hills and houses all distinctly shine and thy great ocean slumbers everywhere the mountain ridge against the purple sky stands clear and strong with darkened rocks and dells and cloudless brightness opens wide and high a home aerial where thy presence dwells the chime of bells remote the murmuring sea the song of birds in whispering copse and wood the distant voice of children's thoughtless glee and maiden songs are all one voice of good amid the leaves green mass a sunny play of flesh and shadow stirs like inward life the ship's white sail glides onward far away unhaunted by a dream of storm or strife end of poem this recording is in the public domain god in nature from paracelsus by robert browning from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox .org by craig franklin god in nature i knew i felt perception unexpressed uncomprehended by our narrow thought but somehow felt and known in every shift and change in the spirit nay in every pore of the body even what god is what we are what life is how god tastes an infinite joy in infinite ways one everlasting bliss from whom all being emanates all power proceeds in whom is life for evermore yet whom existence 
in its lowest form includes where dwells enjoyment there is he with still a flying point of bliss remote a happiness in store afar a sphere of distant glory in full view thus climbs pleasure its heights for ever and for ever the centre fire heaves underneath the earth and the earth changes like a human face the molten ore bursts up among the rocks winds into the stone's heart out branches bright in hidden mines spots barren river beds crumbles into fine sand where sunbeams bask god joys therein the wrath sea's waves are edged with foam white as the bitten lips of hate when in the solitary waste strange groups of young volcanoes come up cyclops like staring together with their bright eyes on flame god tastes a pleasure in their uncouth pride then all is still earth is a wintry clod but spring wind like a dancing sultress passes over its breast to waken it rare verdure buds tenderly upon rough banks between the withered tree roots and the cracks of frost like a smile striving with a wrinkled face the grass grows bright the boughs are swollen with blooms like chrysalids impatient for the air the shining doors are busy beetles run along the furrows ants make their ado above birds fly in merry flocks the lark soars up and up shivering for very joy afar the ocean sleeps white fishing gulls flit where the strand is purple with its tribe of nesting limpets savage creatures seek their loves in wood and plain and god renews his ancient rapture thus he dwells in all from life's minute beginnings up at last to man the consummation of this scheme of being the completion of this sphere of life whose attributes had here and there been scattered o'er the visible world before asking to be combined dim fragments meant to be united in some wondrous whole imperfect qualities throughout creation suggesting some one creature yet to make some point where all those scattered rays should meet convergent in the faculties of man end of poem this recording is in the public domain my heart leaps up by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by thomas peter my heart leaps up my heart leaps up when i behold a rainbow in the sky so was it when my life began so is it now i am a man so be it when i shall grow old or let me die the child is father of the man and i could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety end of poem this recording is in the public domain Each and All by Ralph Waldo Emerson from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Each and All Little thinks in the field yon red-cloaked clown of thee from the hilltop looking down. The heifer that lows in the upland farm, far heard, lows not thine ear to charm. The sexton tolling his bell at noon deems not that great Napoleon stops his horse and lists with delight, whilst his files sweep round yon alpine height, nor knowest thou what argument thy life to thy neighbor's creed has lent. All are needed by each one, nothing is fair or good alone. 
I thought the sparrow's note from heaven, Singing at dawn on the alder bough. I brought him home in his nest at even. He sings the song, but it pleases not now. For I did not bring home the river and sky. He sang to my ear, they sang to my eye. The delicate shells lay on the shore. The bubbles of the latest wave fresh pearls to their enamel gave. And the bellowing of the savage sea greeted their safe escape to me. I wiped away the weeds and foam. I fetched my seaborne treasures home. But the poor, unsightly, noisome things had left their beauty on the shore, with the sun and the sand and the wild uproar. The lover watched his graceful maid as mid the virgin train she strayed, nor knew her beauty's best attire was woven still by the snow white choir. At last she came to his hermitage, like the bird from the woodlands to the cage. The gay enchantment was undone, a gentle wife, but fairy none. Then I said, I covet truth, beauty is unripe childhood's cheat, I leave it behind with the games of youth. As I spoke beneath my feet, the ground pine curled its pretty wreath, Running over the club moss burrs, I inhaled the violet's breath. Around me stood the oaks and firs, pine cones and acorns lay on the ground. Over me soared the eternal sky, full of light and of deity. Again I saw, again I heard, the rolling river, the morning bird. Beauty through my senses stole. I yielded myself to the perfect whole. Ralph Waldo Emerson End of poem This recording is in the public domain The Country Faith by Norman Gale From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter The Country Faith Here in the country's heart where the grass is green life is the same sweet life as it e'er hath been trust in a god still lives and the bell at morn floats with a thought of god o'er the rising corn god comes down in the rain and the crop grows tall this is the country faith and the best of all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tintin Abbey by William Wordsworth. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Tintin Abbey Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs. With a soft inland murmur once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid grove and copses. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me, as in a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft 
in lonely rooms amid the din of towns and cities i have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love nor less i trust to them i may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things if this be but a vain belief yet oh how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart how oft in spirit have i turned to thee o sylvan why thou wanderer through the woods how often has my spirit turned to thee and now with gleams of half-extinguished thought with many recognitions dim and faint and somewhat of a sad perplexity the picture of the mind revives again while here i stand not only with the sense of present pleasure but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years and so i dare to hope though changed no doubt from what i was when first i came among these hills when like a row i bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams wherever nature led more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved for nature then the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by to me was all in all i cannot paint what then i was the sounding cataract haunted me like a passion the tall rock the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood their colours and their forms were then to me an appetite a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied nor any interest unborrowed from the eye that time is past and all its aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures not for this faint i nor mourn nor murmur other gifts have followed for such loss i would believe abundant recompense for i have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity nor harsh nor grating though of ample power to chasten and subdue and i have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things all objects of all thought and rolls through all things therefore am i still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear both what they half create and what perceive well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts the nurse the guide 
the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being nor perchance if i were not thus taught should i the more suffer my genial spirits to decay for thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river thou my dearest friend my dear dear friend and in thy voice i catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes oh yet a little while may i behold in thee what i was once my dear dear sister and this prayer i make knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her it is her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy for she can so inform the mind that is within us so impress with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues rash judgments nor the sneers of selfish men nor greetings where no kindness is nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessing therefore let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee and in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms thy memory be as a dwelling-place for all sweet sounds and harmonies oh then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations nor perchance if i should be where i no more can hear thy voice nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence will thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together and that i so long a worshipper of nature hither came unwearied in that service rather say with warmer love o oh, what far deeper zeal of holier love nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings many years of absence these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this great pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Great Nature is an Army Gay by Richard Watson Gilder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Great Nature is an Army Gay Great nature is an army gay, resistless marching on its way. I hear the bugles clear and sweet, I hear the tread of million feet. Across the plain I see it pour, it tramples down the waving grass. Within the echoing mountain pass I hear a thousand cannon roar. It swarms within my garden gate, my deepest well it drinketh dry, it doth not rest it doth not wait by night and day it sweepeth by ceaseless it marches by my door it heeds me not though i implore i know not whence it comes nor where it goes for me it doth not care whether i starve or eat or sleep or live or die or sing or weep and now the banners are all bright now torn and blackened by the fight sometimes its laughter shakes the sky sometimes the groans of those who die still through the night and through the livelong day the infinite army marches on its remorseless way end of poem this recording is in the public domain come to these scenes of peace by William Lyle Bowles From The World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao
Come to these scenes of peace. Come to these scenes of peace, Where, to rivers murmuring, The sweet birds all the summer sing, Where cares and toil and sadness cease. Stranger, does thy heart deplore Friends whom thou wilt see no more? Does thy wounded spirit prove Pangs of hopeless, severed love? Thee the stream that gushes clear, Thee the birds that carol near, Shall soothe, as silent thou dost lie, And dream of their wild lullaby. Come to bless these scenes of peace, Where cares and toil and sadness cease. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on the Pleasure Arising from Vicissitude by Thomas Gray From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ode on the Pleasure Arising from Vicissitude Now the golden morn aloft Waves her dew-bespangled wing With vermeil cheek and whisper soft she woos the tardy spring till april starts and calls around the sleeping fragrance from the ground and lightly o'er the living scene scatters his freshest tenderest green newborn flocks in rustic dance frisking ply their feeble feet forgetful of their wintry trance the birds his presence greet but chief the skylark warbles high his trembling, thrilling ecstasy, and lessening from the dazzled sight, melts into air and liquid light. Yesterday the sullen year saw the snowy whirlwind fly. Mute was the music of the air, the herd stood drooping by. Their raptures now that wildly flow, no yesterday nor morrow know. Tis man alone that joy descries with forward and reverted eyes. Smiles on past misfortune's brow, soft reflection's hand can trace, and o'er the cheek of sorrow throw a melancholy grace, while hope prolongs our happier hour, or deepest shades that dimly lower, and black and round our weary way gilds with a gleam of distant day. Still, where rosy pleasure leads, see a kindred grief pursue, behind the steps that misery treads, approaching comfort view. The hues of bliss more brightly glow, chastised by sabler tints of woe, and blended form with artful strife, the strength and harmony of life. See the wretch that long has tossed on the thorny bed of pain, at length repair his vigor lost, and breathe and walk again. The meanest floweret of the vale, the simplest note that swells the gale, the common sun, the air, the skies, to him are opening paradise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nature by Jones Vary From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama Nature The bubbling brook doth leap when I come by, Because my feet find measure with its call. The birds know when the friend they love is nigh, For I am known to them, both great and small. The flower that on the lonely hillside grows Expects me there when spring its bloom has given, And many a tree and bush my wanderings knows, And e'en the clouds and silent stars of heaven. For he who is with his maker walks aright, Shall be their lord as Adam was before. His ear shall catch each sound with new delight, Each object wear the dress that then it wore. And he, as when erect in soul he stood, Hear from his father's lips that all is good. Jones Vary End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Influence of Natural Objects from the Prelude, 1, by William Wordsworth. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Influence of Natural Objects Wisdom and Spirit of the Universe, Thou Soul, Thou Art the Eternity of Thought and gives to forms and images a breath and everlasting motion not in vain by day or starlight thus from my first dawn of childhood didst thou intertwine for me the passions that build up our human soul not with the mean and vulgar works of man but with high objects with enduring things with life and nature purifying thus the elements of feeling and of thought and sanctifying by such discipline both pain and fear until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart nor was this fellowship vouchsafed to me with stinted kindness in november days when vapors rolling down the valleys made a lonely scene more lonesome among woods at noon and mid the calm of summer nights when by the margin of the trembling lake beneath the gloomy hills homeward i went in solitude such intercourse was mine mine was it in the fields both day and night and by the waters all the summer long and in the frosty season when the sun was set and visible for many a mile the cottage windows through the twilight blazed i heeded not the summons happy time it was indeed for all of us for me it was a time of rapture clear and loud the village clock told six i wheeled about proud and exulting like an untired horse that cares not for his home all shod with steel we hissed along the polished ice in games confederate imitative of the chase and woodland pleasures the resounding horn the pack loud chimed and the hunted hare so through the darkness and the cold we flew and not a voice was idle with the din smitten the precipices rang aloud the leafless trees and every icy crag tinkled like iron while far distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy not unnoticed while the stars eastward were sparkling clear and in the west the orange sky of evening died away not seldom from the uproar i retired into a silent bay or sportively glanced sideways leaving the tumultuous throng to cut across the reflex of a star image that flying still before me gleamed upon the glassy plain and oftentimes when we had given our bodies to the wind and all the shadowy banks on either side came sweeping through the darkness spinning still the rapid line of motion then at once have i reclining back upon my heels stopped short yet still the solitary cliffs wheeled by me even as if the earth had rolled with visible motion her diurnal round behind me did they stretch in solemn train feebler and feebler and I stood and watched till all was tranquil as a summer sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Indian Song by William Butler Yeats From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. An Indian Song O oh, wanderer in the sullen weather, Our isle awaits us, On each lee the peahens dance, In crimson feather, A parrot swaying on a tree, Rages at his own image in the enamelled sea. There her dreamy time lets fall his sickle, And life the sandals of her fleetness, 
and sleek young joy is no more fickle, and love is kindly and deceitless, and all is over save the murmur and the sweetness. There we will moor our lonely ship, and wander ever with woven hands, murmuring softly, lip to lip, along the grass, along the sands, murmuring how far away are all earth's feverish lands. How we alone of mortals are, hid in the earth's most hidden part, while grows our love an Indian star, a meteor of the burning heart, one with the waves that softly round us laugh and dart. One with the leaves, one with the dove that moans and sighs a hundred days. How when we die our shades will rove, dropping at eve and coral bays, a vapory footfall on the ocean's sleepy blaze. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Table's Turned by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter The Table's Turned Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, Or surely you'll grow double. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks, why all this toil and trouble? The sun, above the mountain's head, A freshening luster mellow Through all the long green fields has spread His first sweet evening yellow. Books! Tis a dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet, How sweet his music! On my life there's more of wisdom in it. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings. He too is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. She has a world of ready wealth, our minds and hearts to bless. Spontaneous wisdom breathed by health, truth breathed by cheerfulness. One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. Sweet is the lore which nature brings. Our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things. We murder to dissect. Enough of science and of art. Close up those barren leaves. Come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rus in Orbe by Clement Scott From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator Jason in Panama as the poets And Craig Franklin as the reckless fellow Rus in Orbe Poets are singing the whole world over Of May and melody, joys for June, Dusting their feet in the careless clover, And filling their hearts with the blackbird's tune. The brown bright nightingale strikes with pity The sensitive heart of a count or clown. But where is the song for our leafy city, And where the rhymes for our lovely town? Oh, for the Thames and its rippling reaches, Where almond rushes and breezes sport. Take me a walk under Burnham beaches, Give me a dinner at Hampton Court. Poets, be still, though your hearts I harden. We flowers by day, and have scents at dark. The limes are in leaf in the cockney garden, And lilacs blossom in Regent's Park. Come for a blow, says a reckless fellow, Burned red and brown by passionate sun. Come to the downs where the gorse is yellow, The season of kisses has just begun. Come to the fields where bluebells shiver, Bear cuckoo's carol or plaint of dove. Come for a row on the silent river, Come to the meadows and learn to love. 
Yes, I will come when this wealth is over, Of softened color and perfect tone, The lilacs better than fields of clover. I'll come when the blossoming May has flown, When dust and dirt of a trampled city Have dragged the yellow laburnum down. I'll take my holiday, more's the pity, And turn my back upon London town. Margaret, am I so wrong to love it, This misty town that your face shines through? A crown of blossom is waved above it, But heart and life of the world, Tis you, Margaret, Pearl, I have sought and found you, And though the paths of the wind are free, I'll follow the ways of the world around you, And build my nest on the nearest tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fawn A Fragment by Richard Hovey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Fawn A Fragment I will go out to grass with that old king, for I am weary of clothes and cooks. I long to lie along the banks of brooks, and watch the boughs above me sway and sing. Come, I will pluck off custom's livery, no longer be a lackey to old time. Time shall serve me, and at my feet shall fling the spoil of listless minutes. I shall climb the wild trees for my food, and run through dale and upland as the fox runs free. Laugh for cool joy and sleep in the warm sun, And men will call me mad, like that old king. For I am woodland-natured, and have made dryads my bedfellows, And I have played with the sleek naiads in the splash of the pools, And made a mock of gowned and trousered fools. Helen, none knows better than thou how like a fawn I strayed. And I am half fawn now, and my heart goes out to the forest and the crack of twigs. The drip of wet leaves and the low soft laughter of brooks that chuckle o'er old mossy jests, and say them over to themselves, the nests of squirrels and the holes the chipmunk digs, where through the branches the slant rays dapple with sunlight the leaf-matted ground, and the wind comes with blown vestures rustling after, and through the woven lattice of crisp sound a bird's song lightens like a maiden's face. O oh, wildwood Helen, let them strive and fret, those goggled men with their dissecting knives. Let them in charnel houses pass their lives, and seek in death life's secret. And let those hard-faced wildlings prematurely old, gnaw their thick lips with vain desire to get Portia's fair fame or Lesbia's carcanet or crown of Caesar, or Catullus, Apicius's lampreys, or Crassus's gold. For these consider many things, but yet by land or sea they shall not find the way to Arcady, the old home of the awful heart-dear mother, where too child dreams and long rememberings lull far from the cares that overlay and smother the memories of old woodland outdoor mirth, in the dim first life burst centuries ago, the sense of the freedom and nearness of earth. Nay, this they shall not know, for who goes thither, leaves all the cock and clutch of his soul behind, the doves defiled and the serpent shrined, the hates that wax and the hopes that wither, nor does he journey, seeking where it be, but wakes and finds himself in Arcady. Hist! There's a stir in the brush. Was it a face through the leaves? Back of the laurels a scurry and rush, hillward, then silence, except for the thrush, that throws one song from the dark of the bush, and is gone. And I plunge in the wood, and a swift soul cleaves through the swirl and the flow of the leaves. As a swimmer stands with his white limbs bare to the sun, for the space that a breath has held, and drops in the sea, and the undulant woodland folds around me, intimate, fluctuant, free, like the clasp and the cling of the waters, and the reach and the effort is done, 
There is only the glory of living, exultant to be. A goodly damp smell of the ground, a rough, sweet bark of the trees, O oh, clear, sharp cracklings of sound. O oh, life that's a thrill and a bound with a vigour of boyhood and morning and the noontide's rapture of ease. Was there ever a weary heart in the world, a lag in the body's urge or a flag of the spirit's wings? Did a man's heart ever break for a lost hope's sake? For here there is lilt in the quiet and calm and the quiver of things, I, this old oak, grey-grown and gnarled, solemn and sturdy and big, is as young of heart, as alert and elate in his rest, as the nuthatch there that clings to the tip of the twig, and scolds as the wind that buffets too rudely its nest. Oh, what is it breathes in the air? Oh, what is it touches my cheek? There's a sense of a presence that lurks in the branches. But where? Is it far? Is it far to seek? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Invocation to Light From Paradise Lost, Book 3 By John Milton from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Invocation to Light from Paradise Lost, Book 3. Hail, holy light, offspring of heaven firstborn, or of the eternal, co eternal beam, may I express thee unblamed. Since God is light, and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity, dwelt then in thee, bright effluence of bright essence increate. Or hearst thou rather pure ethereal stream, whose fountain who shall tell? Before the sun, before the heavens, thou wert, and at the voice of God, as with a mantle, did invest the rising world of waters dark and deep. One from the void and formless infinite. Thee I revisit now with bolder wing, Escape the Stygian pool, Though long detained in that obscure sojourn, While in my flight, through utter and through middle darkness born, With other notes than to the Orphean lyre, I sung of chaos and eternal night, Taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent, and up to reascend, though hard and rare. Thee I revisit safe, and feel thy sovereign vital lamp. But thou revisitest not these eyes, that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray, and find no dawn. So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs, or dim suffusion veiled. Yet not the more cease I to wander where the muses haunt clear spring, or shady grove, or sunny hill, Smit with the love of sacred song. But chief thee, Sion, and the flowery brooks beneath, That wash thy hallowed feet, and warbling flow, Nightly I visit, nor sometimes forget Those other two equalled with me in fate, So were I equalled with them in renown. Blind Thamiris, and blind Meonides, and Tiresias and Phineas, prophets old. Then feed on thoughts that voluntary move harmonious numbers, as the wakeful bird sings darkling, and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note. Thus would the year's seasons return, but not to me returns day, or the sweet approach of even or morn, or sight of vernal bloom, or summer's rose, or flocks, or herds, or human face divine. But cloud instead, and ever during dark, surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off, and for the book of knowledge fair presented with a universal blank of nature's works, to me expunged and raised, and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather thou, celestial light, 
shine inward, and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse, that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Light from Paradise Lost, Book 7, by John Milton. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org, by Craig Franklin. Light. Let there be light, God said, and forthwith light, ethereal, first of things, quintessence pure, sprung from the deep, and from her native east to journey through the airy gloom began sphered in a radiant cloud for yet the sun was not she in a cloudy tabernacle sojourned the while god saw the light was good and light from darkness by the hemisphere divided light the day and darkness night he named end of poem this recording is in the public domain Light by George MacDonald from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Light, thou art the joy of age. Thy sun is dear when long the shadow falls. Forth to its friendliness the old man crawls, and, like the bird hung in his poor cage to gather song from radiance, in his chair sits by the door, and sitteth there his soul within him, like a child that lies half dreaming with half open eyes at close of a long afternoon in summer. High ruins around him, ancient ruins, where the raven is almost the only comer. Half dreams, half broods in wonderment at thy celestial descent. Through rifted loops alighting on the gold that waves its bloom in many an airy rent, so dreams the old man's soul, that is not old, but sleepy mid the ruins that enfold. What soul-like changes, evanescent moods, upon the face of the still passive earth, its hills and fields and woods, thou with thy seasons and thy hours art ever calling forth even like a lord of music bent over his instrument who gives to tears and smiles an equal birth when clear as holiness the morning ray casts the rock's dewy darkness at its feet mottling with shadows all the mountain gray when at the hour of sovereign noon infinite silent cataracts sheet shadowless through the air of thunder-breeding june and when the yellower glory slanting passes twixt longer shadows o'er the meadow grasses when now the moon lifts up her shining shield high on the peak of a cloud hill revealed now crescent lo wandering sun dazed away unconscious of her own star-mingled ray her still face seeming more to think than see makes the pale world lie dreaming dreams of thee no mood of mind no melody of soul but lies within thy silent soft control of operative single power and simple unity the one emblem yet all the colors that our passionate eyes devour in rainbow moonbow or in opal gem are the melodious descant of divided thee lo thee in yellow sands lo thee in the blue air and sea in the green corn with scarlet poppies lit thy half souls parted patient thou dost sit lo thee in speechless glories of the west lo thee in dewdrops tiny breast thee on the vast white cloud that floats away bearing upon its skirt a brown moon-ray regent of color 
Thou dost fling thy overflowing skill on everything. The thousand hues and shades upon the flowers Are all the pastime of thy leisure hours. And all the jeweled ores in mines that hidden be Are dead till touched by thee. George MacDonald End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. The Northern Lights by Benjamin Franklin Taylor From The World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao The Northern Lights To claim the Arctic came the sun With banners of the burning zone Unrolled upon their airy spars They froze beneath the light of stars and there they float, those streamers old, those northern lights, forever cold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem from the Hymn to Light by Abraham Cowley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin From the Hymn to Light Say, from what golden quivers of the sky Do all thy winged arrows fly? Swiftness and power by birth are thine, From thy great sire they came, Thy sire the word divine. Thou in the moon's bright chariot proud and gay Dost thy bright wood of stars survey, And all the year dost with thee bring Of thousand flowery lights thine own nocturnal spring. Thou Scythian-like dost thou but beep, beep, beep. Thou Scythian-like dost round thy lands above The sun's gilt tent forever move, And still, as thou in prompt dost go, The shining pageants of the world attend thy show nor amidst all these triumphs dost thou scorn the humble glow-worms to adorn and with those living spangles gild o greatness without pride the bushes of the field night and her ugly subject thou dost fright and sleep the lazy owl of night ashamed and fearful to appear they screen their horrid shapes with the black hemisphere at thy appearance grief itself it said to shake his wings and rouse his head and cloudy care has often took a gentle beamy smile reflected from thy look at thy appearance fear itself grows bold the sunshine melts away his cold encouraged at the sight of thee to the cheek colour comes and firmness to the knee when goddess thou lifts up thy wakened head out of the morning's purple bed thy choir of birds about thee play and all the joyful world salutes the rising day all the world's bravery that delights our eyes is but thy several liveries thou the rich dye on them bestowest thy nimble pencil paints this landscape as thou goest a crimson garment in the rose thou wearest a crown of studded gold thou bearest the virgin lilies in their white are clad but with the lawn of almost naked light the violet springs little infant stands girt in thy purple swaddling bands on the fair tulip thou dost dote thou clothest it in a gay and party-coloured coat through the soft ways of heaven and air and sea which open all their pores to thee like a clear river thou dost glide and with thy living streams through the close channel slide but the vast ocean of unbounded day in the empyrean heaven dost stay thy rivers lakes and springs below from thence took first their rise thither at last must flow end of poem this recording is in the public domain.
Daybreak by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as narrator And Sonia as the wind Daybreak A wind came up out of the sea and said O oh, mists, make room for me it hailed the ships and cried sail on ye mariners the night is gone and hurried landward far away crying awake it is the day it said unto the forest shout hang all your leafy banners out it touched the woodbird's folded wing and said o bird awake and sing and o'er the farms o oh, chanticleer your clarion blow the day is near it whispered to the fields of corn bow down and hail the coming morn it shouted through the belfry tower awake o oh bell proclaim the hour it crossed the churchyard with a sigh and said not yet in quiet lie End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dawn by Richard Watson Gilder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Dawn The night was dark Though sometimes a faint star, a little while, a little space made bright. The night was long and like an iron bar lay heavy on the land, till o'er the sea, slowly within the east, there grew a light which half was starlight and half seemed to be the herald of a greater. The pale white turned slowly to pale rose, and up the height of heaven slowly climbed. The grey sea grew rose-coloured like the sky. A white gull flew straight toward the utmost boundary of the east, where slowly the rose gathered and increased. It was as on the opening of a door by one that in his hand a lamp doth hold, whose flame is hidden by the garment's fold, the still air moves. The wide room is less dim. More bright the east became. The ocean turned dark and more dark against the brightening sky. Sharper against the sky the long sea line. The hollows of the breakers on the shore were green like leaves whereon no sun doth shine. Though white the outer branches of the tree, from rose to red, the level heaven burned, then sudden, as if a sword fell from on high, a blade of gold flashed on the horizon's rim. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Morning Song by Joanna Bailey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Morning Song Up quid thy bar late wears the hour Long have the rooks called round the tower O flower and tree loud hums the bee And the wild kid sports merrily The sun is bright, the sky is clear Wake, lady, wake and hasten here up, maiden fair, and bind thy hair, and rouse thee in the breezy air. The lulling stream that soothes thy dream is dancing in the sunny beam. Waste not these hours so fresh, so gay, leave thy soft couch and haste away. Up time will tell the morning bell, its service sound has chimed well. 
The aged crone keeps house alone, the reapers to the fields are gone. Lose not these hours so cool, so gay, lo, while thou sleeps, they haste away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Morning by John Cunningham From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Morning In the barn the tenant cock Close to partlet perched on high Briskly crows the shepherd's clock Jokin' that the morning's nigh Swiftly from the mountain's brow Shadows, nursed by night, retire, And the peeping sunbeam now Paints with gold the village spire. Philomel forsakes the thorn, Plaintive where she prates at night, And the lark, to meet the morn, Soars beyond the shepherd's sight. From the low-roofed cottage ridge See the chattering swallow spring, Darting through the one-arched bridge, Quick she dips her dappled wing. Now the pine tree's waving top Gently greets the morning gale. Kidlings now begin to crop, Daisies on the dewy dale. From the balmy sweets, uncloyed, Restless till her task be done, Now the busy bees employed, Sipping dew before the sun. Trickling through the creviced rock, where the limpid stream distills. Sweet refreshment waits the flock when tis sun drove from the hills. Collins for the promised corn, ere the harvest hopes are ripe, anxious, whilst the huntsman's horn, boldly sounding, drowns his pipe. Sweet, oh sweet, the warbling throng on the white and blossom spray. Nature's universal song echoes to the rising day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pack Clouds Away by Thomas Hayward From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Pack Clouds Away Pack clouds away, and welcome day, With night we banish sorrow. Sweet air, blow soft, mount lark aloft, To give my love good morrow. Wings from the wind to please her mind, Notes from the lark I'll borrow. Bird, prune thy wing, nightingale, sing, To give my love good morrow, To give my love good morrow. Notes from them all I'll borrow. Wake from thy nest, robin red breast, Sing, birds in every furrow, And from each hill let music shrill, Give my fair love good morrow. Blackbird and thrush in every bush, Stare linnet and cock sparrow, You petty elves amongst yourselves, Sing my fair love good morrow. To give my love good morrow, Sing, birds in every furrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Morning from the Minstrel by James Beatty. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Morning. But who the melodies of morn can tell? The wild brook babbling down the mountain side. The lowing herd, the sheepfold, simple bell, The pipe of early shepherd dim descried, In the lone valley echoing far and wide, The clamorous horn along the cliffs above, The hollow murmur of the ocean tide, The hum of bees, the linnet's lay of love, And the full choir that wakes the universal grove. The cottage curs at early pilgrim bark, Crowned with her pail, the tripping milkmaid sings, the whistling ploughman stalks afield, and hark, down 
the rough slope the ponderous wagon rings through rustling corn the hare astonished springs slow tolls the village clock the drowsy hour the partridge bursts away on whirring wings deep mourns the turtle in sequestered bower and shrill lark carols clear from her aerial tower end of poem this recording is in the public domain summer rain by hartley coleridge from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by sonia summer rain thick lay the dust uncomfortably white in glaring mimicry of arab sand the woods and mountains slept in hazy light the meadows looked athirst and tawny tanned the little rills had left their channels bare with scarce a pool to witness what they were and the shrunk river gleamed mid oozy stones that stared like any famished giant's bones sudden the hills grew black and hot as stove the air beneath it was a toil to be there was a growling as of angry jove provoked by juno's prying jealousy a flash a crash the firmament was split and down it came in drops the smallest fit to drown a bee in foxglove bell concealed joy filled the brook and comfort cheered the field end of poem this recording is in the public domain the oasis of sidi khaled by wilfred scorn blunt from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox.org by craig franklin the oasis of sidi khaled how the earth burns each pebble underfoot is as a living thing with power to wound the white sand quivers and the footfall mute of the slow camels strikes but gives no sound as though they walked on flame not solid ground tis noon and the beasts shadows even have fled back to their feet and there is fire around and fire beneath and the sun overhead pitiful heaven what is this we view tall trees a river pools where swallows fly thickets of oleander where doves coo shades deep as midnight greenness for tired eyes hark how the light winds in the palm tops sigh oh this is rest oh this is paradise end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Midsummer's Noon in the Australian Forest by Charles Harper from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. A Midsummer's Noon in the Australian Forest Not a sound disturbs the air, there is quiet everywhere. Over plains and over woods what a mighty stillness broods. All the birds and insects keep where the coolest shadows sleep. Even the busy ants are found resting in their pebbled mound. Even the locust clingeth now silent to the barky bough. Over hills and over plains, quiet, vast, and slumberous reigns. Only there's a drowsy humming from yon warm lagoon slow coming. Tis the dragon hornet, see? all bedaubed resplendently yellow on a tawny ground each rich spot not square nor round rudely heart-shaped as it were the blurred and hasty impressed there of a vermeil crusted seal dusted o'er with golden meal 
only there's a droning where yon bright beetle shines in air tracks it in its gleaming flight with a slanting beam of light rising in the sunshine higher till its shards flame out like fire every other thing is still save the ever wakeful rill whose cool murmur only throws cooler comfort round repose or some ripple in the sea of leafy boughs where lazily tired summer in her bower turning with the noontide hour heaves a slumbrous breath ere she once more slumbers peacefully oh tis easeful here to lie hidden from noon's scorching eye in this grassy cool recess musing thus of quietness charles harper end of poem this recording is in the public domain Noontide by John Layden from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Noontide, beneath a shivering canopy reclined of aspen leaves that wave without a wind, I love to lie when lulling breezes stir the spiry cones that tremble on the fir, or wander mid the dark green fields of broom when pierce in scattered tufts the yellow bloom or trace the path with tangling firs overrun when bursting seed bells crackle in the sun and pittering grasshoppers confusedly shrill pipe giddily along the glowing hill sweet grasshopper who loves that noon to lie serenely in the green ribbed clover's eye to sun thy filmy wings and emerald vest unseen thy form and undisturbed thy rest oft have i listening mused the sultry day and wondered what thy chirping song might say when naught was heard along the blossomed lea to join thy music save the listless bee end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Summer Noon by William Howitt From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao A Summer Noon Who has not dreamed a world of bliss On a bright sunny noon like this? Couched by his native brick's green maze With comrade of his boyish days While all around them seemed to be just as in joyous infancy who has not loved at such an hour upon that heath in birchen bower lulled in the poet's dreamy mood its wild and sunny solitude while o'er the waste of purple ling you mark a sultry glimmering silence herself that seems to sleep wrapped in a slumber long and deep where slowly stray those lonely sheep through the tall foxglove's crimson bloom, And gleaming the scattered broom. Love you not, then, to list and hear The crackling of the gorse flowers near, Pouring an orange-scented tide Of fragrance o'er the desert wide, To hear the buzzards whimpering shrill Hovering above you high and still, The twittering of the bird that dwells Among the heath's delicious bells, while round your bed, o'er fern and blade, Insects in green and gold arrayed, The sun's gay tribes have lightly strayed, And sweeter sound their humming wings Than the proud minstrel's echoing strings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The midges dance aboon the burn by Robert Tannehill, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. The Midges Dance Aboon the Burn The midges dance aboon the burn, the dews begin to fa'. The pair tricks down the rushy home, set up their in and ca. Now loud and clear the blackbirds sang, 
rings through the briery shore, while flitting gay the swallows play around the castle wall. Beneath the golden gloaming sky, the mavis mends her lay. The red breast pours his sweetest strains to charm the lingering day. While weary yeldren seem to wail their little nestlings torn, the merry wren, frae den to den, gaes jinking through the thorn. The roses foul their silken leaves, the foxglove shuts its bell, the honeysuckle and the bark spread fragrance through the dell. Let others crowd the giddy court of mirth and revelry. The simple joys that nature yields are dearer far to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sunset by Percy Bysshe Shelley From The World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Sunset from Queen Mab If solitude hath ever led thy steps To the wild ocean's echoing shore, And thou hast lingered there Until the sun's broad orb Seemed resting on the burnished wave, Thou must have marked the lines of purple gold That motionless hung o'er the sinking sphere, Thou must have marked the billowy clouds, edged with intolerable radiancy, towering like rocks of jet, crowned with a diamond wreath. And yet there is a moment when the sun's highest point peeps like a star o'er ocean's western edge, when those far clouds of feathery gold, shaded with deepest purple, gleam like islands on a dark blue sea. Then has thy fancy soared above the earth, and furled its wearied wing within the fairy's vein. Yet not the golden islands gleaming in yon flood of light, nor the feathery curtains stretching o'er the sun's bright couch, nor the burnished ocean's waves paving that gorgeous dome, so fair, so wonderful a sight as Mab's ethereal palace could afford. Yet likest evening's vault, that fairy hall, Heaven low resting on the wave it spread, Its floors of flashing light, Its vast and azure dome, Its fertile golden islands Floating on a silver sea. Whilst suns their mingling beamings Darted through clouds of circumambient darkness, And pearly battlements around Looked o'er the immense of heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fancy in Nubibus by Samuel Taylor Coldridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Fancy in Nubibus Oh, it is pleasant with a heart at ease, Just after sunset or by moonlight skies, To make the shifting clouds be what you please, Or let the easily persuaded eyes Own each quaint likeness issuing from the mould Of a friend's fancy, Or with head bent low and cheek aslant See rivers flow of gold, Twixt crimson banks, And then a traveller go from mount to mount through cloudland gorgeous land or listen to the tide with closed sight be that blind bard who on the kian strand by those deep sounds possessed with inward light beheld the iliad and the odyssey rise to the swelling of the voiceful sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain Day is Dying, from the Spanish Gypsy, by Marion Evans Lewis Cross, George Eliot. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. Day is Dying, from the Spanish Gypsy. 
Day is dying, float, O oh song, down the westward river. Requiem chanting to the day, day the mighty giver. Pierced by shafts of time he bleeds, melted ruby sending through the river and the sky, earth and heaven bleeding. All the long drawn earth it banks, up to cloudland lifting, slow between them drifts the swan, twixt to heavens drifting. Wings half open like a flower, inly deeper flushing, neck and breast as virgins pure, virgin proudly blushing. Day is dying, float, O oh swan, down the ruby river. Follow song in requiem to the mighty giver. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The End of the Day by Duncan Campbell Scott From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Lian Yao as the bowels And Thomas Peter as the hermit thrush The End of the Day I hear the bells at eventide Peal softly, one by one Near and far off they break and glide Across the stream float faintly beautiful The antiphonal bells of Hull. The day is done, done, done. The day is done. The dew has gathered in the flowers Like tears from some unconscious deep. The swallows whirl around the towers, The light runs out beyond the long cloud bars And leaves the single stars. Tis time for sleep, sleep, sleep. Tis time for sleep. The hermit thrush begins again, timorous Aramite, that song of risen tears and pain, as if the one he loved was far away. Alas, another day. And now, good night, good night, good night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Evening by Archibald Lampman from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Evening. From upland slopes I see the cows file by, lowing, great chested, down the homeward trail, by dusking fields and meadows shining pale with moon tipped dandelions. Flickering high, a peevish nighthawk in the western sky beats up into the lucent solitudes, or drops with grinding wing. The stilly woods grow dark and deep, and gloom mysteriously. Cool night winds creep and whisper in mine ear. The homely cricket gossips at my feet. From far off pools and wastes of reeds, I hear with ebb and change. The chanting frogs break sweet in full Pandean chorus. One by one shine out the stars, and the great night comes on. Archibald Lampman End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Twilight Fancy by Dora Reed Goodale from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by craig franklin a twilight fancy i sit here and the earth is wrapped in snow and the cold air is thick with falling night i think of the still dewy summer eves when cows came slowly sauntering up the lane waiting to nibble at the juicy grass when the green earth was full of changing life 
when the warm wind blew soft and slowly past, caressing now and then some wayside flower, stopping to stir the tender maple leaves and breathing all its fragrance on the air. I think of the broad meadows daisy white with the long shade of some stray apple tree falling across them, and the rustlings faint when evening breezes shook along the grass. I think of all the thousand summer sounds, the crickets chirp repeated far and near, the sleepy note of robins in their nest, the whip poor will whose sudden cry rang out, plaintive yet strong, upon the startled air. And so it was the summer twilight fell, and deepened to the darkness of the night. And now I lift my heart out of my dream, and see inside the pale, cold, dying lights, the dull grey skies, the barren, snow-clad fields that come to us when winter evenings come. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Evening Star by Thomas Campbell From The World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao To the Evening Star Star that bringest home the bee And sets the weary labourer free If any star shed peace, Tis thou that sensed it from above Appearing when heaven's breath and brow are sweet as hers we love. Come to the luxuriant skies, whilst the landscape's odours rise, whilst far off lowing herds are heard, and songs when toil is done. From cottages where smoke unstirred curls yellow in the sun. Star of love's soft interviews, parted lovers on thee muse, their remembrancer in heaven, of thrilling vows thou art, too delicious to be riven by absence from the heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Evening Wind by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia the evening wind spirit that breathes through my lattice thou that cools the twilight of the sultry day gratefully flows thy freshness round my brow thou hast been out upon the deep at play riding all day the wild blue waves till now roughening their crests and scattering high their spray and swelling the white sail i welcome thee to the scorched land thou wanderer of the sea nor i alone a thousand bosoms round inhale thee in the fullness of delight and languid forms rise up and pulses bound livelier at coming of the wind of night and languishing to hear thy welcome sound lies the vast inland stretched beyond the sight go forth into the gathering shade go forth God's blessing breathed upon the fainting earth. Go, rock the little woodbird in his nest, curl the still waters bright with stars, and rouse the wide old wood from his majestic rest, summoning from the innumerable boughs the strange deep harmonies that haunt his breast. Pleasant shall be thy way where meekly bows the shutting flower and darkling waters pass and where the overshadowing branches sweep the grass. Stoop over the place of graves, and softly sway the sighing herbage by the gleaming stone, that they who near the churchyard willows stray, and listen in the deepening gloom alone, may think of gentle souls that passed away, like thy pure breath, into the vast unknown, sent forth from heaven among the sons of men, and gone into the boundless heaven again. The faint old man shall lean his silver head to feel thee. Thou shalt kiss the child asleep, and dry the moistened curls that overspread his temples, while his breathing grows more deep. 
and they who stand about the sick man's bed shall joy to listen to thy distant sweep and softly part his curtains to allow thy visit grateful to his burning brow go but the circle of eternal change which is the life of nature shall restore with sounds and scents from all thy mighty range thee to thy birthplace of the deep once more sweet odours in the sea air sweet and strange shall tell the homesick mariner of the shore and listening to thy murmur he shall deem he hears the rustling leaf and running stream end of poem this recording is in the public domain evening in paradise by milton from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Evening in Paradise From Paradise Lost, Book Four Now came still evening on, And twilight grey had in her sober livery All things clad. Silence accompanied, For beast and bird, They to their grassy couch, These to their nests, were slunk all but the wakeful nightingale she all night long her amorous descant sung silence was pleased now glowed the firmament with living sapphires hesperus that led the starry host rode brightest till the moon rising in clouded majesty at length apparent queen unveiled her peerless light and o'er the dark her silver mantle threw End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Evening from Don Juan by Lord Byron From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Evening from Don Juan Ave Maria o'er the earth and sea that heavenliest hour of heaven is worthiest thee ave maria blessed be the hour the time the clime the spot where i so oft have felt that moment in its fullest power sink o'er the earth so beautiful and soft while swung the deep bell and the distant tower or the faint dying day hymn stole aloft, And not a breath crept through the rosy air, And yet the forest leaves seemed stirred with prayer. Ave Maria, tis the hour of prayer. Ave Maria, tis the hour of love. Ave Maria, may our spirits dare Look up to thine and to thy sons above. Ave Maria, oh, that face so fair, Those downcast eyes beneath the almighty dove, But though tis but a pictured image, Strike, that painting is no idol, Tis too like. Sweet hour of twilight, In the solitude of the pine forest, And the silent shore which bounds Ravenna's immemorial wood, Rooted where once the Adrian way flowed o'er, To where the last Caesarian fortress stood, Evergreen forest, Which Boccaccio's lore and Dryden's lame Made haunted ground to me. How have I loved the twilight hour and thee! The shrill Chicalis, people of the pine, Making their summer lives one ceaseless song, Where the soul echoes, save my steeds and mine and vesper bells that rose the boughs along the spectre huntsman of onesti's line his hell dogs and their chase and the fair throng which learned from this example not to fly from a true lover shadowed my mind's eye o oh, hesperus thou bringest all good things home to the weary to the hungry cheer 
to the young bird the parent's brooding wings, the welcome stall to the o'er-laboured steer. Whate'er of peace about our hearthstone clings, whate'er our household gods protect of dear, are gathered round us by thy look of rest. Thou bringst the child, too, to the mother's breast. Soft hour, which wakes the wish and melts the heart of those who sail the seas on the first day when they from their sweet friends are torn apart, or fills with love the pilgrim on his way, as the far bell of vesper makes him start, seeming to weep the dying day's decay. Is this a fancy which our reason scorns? Ah, surely nothing dies, but something mourns. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Moonlight on the Prairie by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as the narrator. Lian Yao as the maiden. Craig Franklin as the oaks. And Sonia as the meadow. Moonlight on the Prairie from Evangeline. Beautiful was the night. Behind the black wall of the forest, tipping its summit with silver, arose the moon. On the river fell here and there through the branches a tremulous gleam of the moonlight, like the sweet thoughts of love on a darkened and devious spirit. Nearer and round about her, the manifold flowers of the garden poured out their souls in odors that were their prayers and confessions unto the night, as it went its way, like a silent Carthusian. Fuller of fragrance than they, and as heavy with shadows and night dews hung the heart of the maiden. The calm and the magical moonlight seemed to inundate her soul with indefinable longings, as through the garden gate and beneath the shade of the oak trees. Passed she along the path to the edge of the measureless prairie. Silent it lay, with a heavy gaze upon it, and fireflies gleaming and floating away in mingled and infinite numbers. Over her head the stars, the thoughts of God in the heavens, shone on the eyes of man who had ceased to marvel and worship, save when a blazing comet was seen on the walls of that temple, as if a hand had appeared and written upon them, Upharsin, and the soul of the maiden between the stars and the fireflies wandered alone, and she cried, O oh Gabriel, O oh my beloved! Art thou so near unto me, and yet I cannot behold thee? Art thou so near unto me, and yet thy voice does not reach me? Ah, oh, how often thy feet have trod this path to the prairie! Ah, oh, how often thine eyes have looked on the woodlands around me! Ah, oh, how often beneath this oak, returning from labour, thou hast lain down to rest, and to dream of me in thy slumbers! When shall these eyes behold, these arms be folded about thee? Loud and sudden and near, the note of a whippoorwill sounded like a flute in the woods, and anon through the neighboring thickets, farther and farther away it floated and dropped into silence. Patience, whispered the oaks from oracular caverns of darkness, and from the moonlit meadow, a sigh responded tomorrow end of poem this recording is in the public domain to delia by samuel daniel from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by craig franklin to Delia Care charmer sleep, son of the sable night, brother to death, in silent darkness born. Relieve my languish and restore the light, with dark forgetting of my care, return, and let the day be time enough to mourn the shipwreck of my ill adventured youth. 
let waking eyes suffice to wail their scorn without the torment of the night's untruth cease dreams the images of day desires to model forth the passion of the morrow never let rising sun approve your liars to add more grief to aggravate my sorrow still let me sleep embracing clouds in vain and never wake to feel the day's disdain end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Camp at Night from The Iliad, Book 8, by Homer, translated from the Greek by George Chapman, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. The Camp at Night from The Iliad, Book 8 The winds transferred into the friendly sky their supper's savour, to the which they sat delightfully and spent all night in open field fires round about them shined as when about the silver moon when air is free from wind and stars shine clear to whose sweet beams high prospects and the brows of all steep hills and pinnacles thrust up themselves for shows and even the lowly valleys joy to glitter in their sight when the unmeasured firmament bursts to disclose her light and all the signs in heaven are seen that glad the shepherd's heart so many fires disclose their beams made by the trojan part for the face of ilion and her bright turrets showed a thousand courts of guard kept fires and every guard allowed fifty stout men by whom their horse eat oats and hard white corn and all did wishfully expect the silver-throned morn. From the Greek of Homer, translation of George Chapman. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Night by Percy Bysshe Shelley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator. Craig Franklin as Death. And Jason in Panama as Sleep. To Night. Swiftly walk over the western wave, spirit of night, out of the misty eastern cave, where all the long and lone daylight thou wovest dreams of joy and fear, which make thee terrible and dear swift be thy flight wrap thy form in a mantle gray star inwrought blind with thine hair the eyes of day kiss her until she be wearied out then wander over city and sea and land touching all with thine opiate wand come long sought when i arose and saw the dawn i sighed for thee when light rode high and the dew was gone and noon lay heavy on flower and tree and the weary day turned to her rest lingering like an unloved guest i sighed for thee thy brother death came and cried wouldst thou me thy sweet child sleep the filmy eyed murmured like a noontide bee shall i nestle near thy side wouldst thou me and i replied no not thee death will come when thou art dead soon too soon sleep will come when thou art fled of neither would i ask the boon i ask of thee beloved night swift be thine approaching flight come soon soon end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Night by Joseph Blanco White From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Night Mysterious night When our first parent knew thee From report divine 
I heard thy name. Did he not tremble for this lovely frame, this glorious canopy of light and blue? Yet, neath a curtain of translucent dew, bathed in the rays of the great setting flame, Hesperus, with the host of heaven came, and lo, creation widened in man's view. Who could have thought such darkness lay concealed within thy beams, O sun? Or who could find, whilst fly and leaf and insect stood revealed, that to such countless orbs thou madest us blind? Why do we then shun death with anxious strife? If light can thus deceive, wherefore not life? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Night from Child Harold, Canto Two, by Lord Byron. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Night. Tis night when meditation bids us feel we once have loved, though love is at an end. The heart, lone mourner of its baffled zeal, though friendless now, will dream it had a friend, who with the weight of years would wish to bend, when youth itself survives young love and joy. Alas, when mingling souls forget to blend, Death hath but little left him to destroy. Ah, happy years, once more who would not be a boy, thus bending over the vessel's laving side to gaze on Dian's wave-reflected sphere. The soul forgets her schemes of hope and pride and flies unconscious o'er each backward year. None are so desolate but something dear dearer than self possesses or possessed a thought and claims the homage of a tear a flashing pang of which the weary breast would still albeit in vain the heavy heart divest to sit on rocks to muse or flood and fell to slowly trace the forest shady scene where things that own not man's dominion dwell and mortal foot hath ne'er or rarely been to climb the trackless mounting all unseen with the wild flock that never needs a fold alone or steeps and foaming falls to lean this is not solitude tis but to hold converse with nature's charms and view her stores unrolled but midst the crowd, the hum, the shock of men, To hear, to see, to feel, and to possess, And roam along the world's tired denizen, With none who bless us, none whom we can bless, Minions of splendour shrinking from distress, None that, with kindred consciousness endued, If we were not, would seem to smile the less Of all that flattered, followed, sought and sued this is to be alone this this is solitude end of poem this recording is in the public domain night by percy bysshe shelley from the world's best poetry Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Night From Queen Mab How beautiful this night! The balmiest sigh which vernal zephyrs breathe in evening's air Were discord to the speaking quietude that wraps this moveless scene. Heaven's ebon vault studded with stars unutterably bright, through which the moon's unclouded grandeur rolls, seems like a canopy, 
which love has spread to curtain her sleeping world. Yon gentle hills, robed in a garment of untrodden snow, Yon darksome rocks, whence icicles depend so stainless that their white and glittering spires tinge not the moon's pure beam. Yon castle steep, whose banner hangeth o'er the time-worn tower so idly that rapt fancy deemeth it a metaphor of peace. All form a scene where musing solitude might love to lift her soul above this sphere of earthliness where silence undisturbed might watch alone, so cold, so bright, so still. The orb of day in southern climes o'er ocean's waveless field sinks sweetly smiling. Not the faintest breath steals o'er the unruffled deep. The clouds of eve reflect, unmoved, the lingering beam of day. And Vesper's image on the western main is beautifully still. Tomorrow comes, cloud upon cloud, in dark and deepening mass, rolls o'er the blackened waters, the deep roar of distant thunder mutters awfully. Tempest unfolds its pinion o'er the gloom that shrouds the boiling surge, the pitiless fiend with all his winds and lightnings, tracks his prey, the torn deep yawns, the vessel finds a grave beneath its jagged gulf. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hymn to the Night by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox.org by sonia hymn to the night aspasie tridistos i heard the trailing garments of the night sweep through her marble halls i saw her sable skirts all fringed with light from the celestial walls i felt her presence by its spell of might stoop over me from above the calm majestic presence of the night as of the one i love i heard the sounds of sorrow and delight the manifold soft chimes that filled the haunted chambers of the night like some old poet's rhymes from the cool cisterns of the midnight air my spirit drank repose the fountain of perpetual peace flows there, from those deep cisterns flows. O holy night, from thee I learn to bear what man has borne before. Thou layest thy finger on the lips of care, and they complain no more. Peace, peace, O resties like I breathe this prayer. Descend with broad-winged flight, the welcome, the thrice prayed for, the most fair, the best beloved night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Wide Awe and Wisdom of the Night by Charles G. D. Roberts. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature. Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. In the Wide Awe and Wisdom of the Night In the wide awe and wisdom of the night I saw the round world rolling on its way. Beyond significance of depth or height, Beyond the interchange of dark and day, I marked the march to which is set no pause and that stupendous orbit round whose rim the great sphere sweeps obedient unto laws that utter the eternal thought of him i compass time outstrip the starry speed and in my still soul apprehended space till weighing laws which these but blindly heed at last i came before him face to face 
and knew the universe of no such span as the august infinitude of man. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Hymn from the Conclusion of the Seasons by James Thompson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter A Hymn from the Conclusion of the Seasons These, as they change, Almighty Father, These are but the varied God. The rolling year is full of thee, Forth in the pleasing spring thy beauty walks, thy tenderness and love. Wide flush the fields, the softening air is balm, echo the mountains round, the forest smiles, and every sense and every heart is joy. Then comes thy glory in the summer months, with light and heat refulgent. Then thy sun shoots full perfection through the swelling year. And oft thy voice in dreadful thunder speaks, And oft at dawn, deep noon, or falling eve, By brooks and groves and hollow whispering gales, Thy bounty shines in autumn unconfined, And spreads a common feast for all that lives. In winter awful thou, with clouds and storms around thee thrown, Tempest o'er tempest rolled, majestic darkness, on the whirlwind's wing, riding sublime, Thou bidst the world adore, And humblest nature with thy northern blast. Mysterious round, what skill, what force divine, Deep felt in these appear, A simple train, yet so delightful mixed, With such kind art, such beauty and beneficence combined, Shade, unperceived, so softening into shade, and all so forming in a harmonious whole, that, as they still succeed, they ravish still. But wandering oft, with brute unconscious gaze, man marks not thee, marks not the mighty hand that, ever busy, wheels the silent spheres, works in the secret deep, Shoots, steaming, thence the fair profusion that o'erspreads the spring, Flings from the sun direct the flaming day, Feeds every creature, hurls the tempest forth, And, as on earth this grateful change revolves, With transport touches all the springs of life. Nature, attend! Join every living soul Beneath the spacious temple of the sky In adoration join! And ardent, raise one general song. To him, ye vocal gales, breathe soft, Whose spirit in your freshness breathes. O oh, talk of him in solitary glooms, Where, o'er the rock, the scarcely waving pine Fills the brown shade with a religious awe. And ye whose bolder note is heard afar, Who shake the astonished world, Lift high to heaven the impetuous song, and say from whom you rage, His praise, ye brooks, a tune, ye trembling rills, And let me catch it as I muse along. Ye headlong torrents, rapid and profound, Ye softer floods, that lead the humid maze Along the vale, and thou, majestic main, A secret world of wonders in thyself, Sound his stupendous praise whose greater voice or bids you roar, or bids your roarings fall. Soft roll your incense, herbs and fruits and flowers, in mingled clouds to him, whose sun exalts, whose breath perfumes you, and whose pencil paints. Ye forests bend, ye harvests wave to him. Breathe your still song into the reaper's heart, as home he goes beneath the joyous moon. Ye that keep watch in heaven, as earth asleep unconscious lies, Effuse your mildest beams, ye constellations, While your angels strike amid the spangled sky, the silver lyre. Great source of day, best image here below of thy creator, 
ever pouring wide from world to world the vital ocean round on nature right with every beam his praise the thunder rolls be hushed the prostrate world while cloud to cloud returns the solemn hymn bleed out afresh ye hills ye mossy rocks retain the sound the broad responsive low ye valleys raise for the great shepherd reigns and his unsuffering kingdom yet will come ye woodlands all awake a boundless song burst from the groves and when the restless day expiring lays the warbling world asleep sweetest of birds sweet philomela charm the listening shades and teach the night his praise ye chief for whom the whole creation smiles at once the head the heart and tongue of all crown the great hymn in swarming cities vast assembled men to the deep organ join the long resounding voice oft breaking clear at solemn pauses through the swelling bass and as each mingling flame increases each in one united ardor rise to heaven or if you rather choose a rural shade and find a fane in every sacred grove there let the shepherd's flute the virgin's lay the prompting seraph and the poet's lyre still sing the god of seasons as they roll for me when i forget the darling theme whether the blossom blows the summer ray russets the plain inspiring autumn gleams or winter rises in the blackening east be my tongue mute my fancy paint no more and dead to joy forget my heart to beat should fate command me to the farthest verge of the green earth to distant barbarous climes rivers unknown to song where first the sun gilds indian mountains or his setting beam flames on the atlantic isles tis not to me since god is ever present ever felt in the void waste as in the city full and where he vital breathes there must be joy and when at last the solemn hour shall come and wing my mystic flight to future worlds i cheerful will obey there with new powers will rising wonders sing i cannot go where universal love not smiles around sustaining all yon orbs and all their sons from seeming evil still adduce in good and better thence again and better still in infinite progression but i lose myself in him in light ineffable come then expressive silence muse his praise end of poem this recording is in the public domain march by william morris from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator, Lian Yao as the birds, and Sonia as death. March. Slayer of winter, art thou here again? O oh, welcome, thou that brings the summer night, the bitter wind makes not thy victory vain, nor will we mock thee for thy faint blue sky. Welcome, O oh March whose kindly days and dry make april ready for the throstle song thou first redresser of the winter's wrong yea welcome march and though i die ere june yet for the hope of life i give thee praise striving to swell the burden of the tune that even now i hear thy brown birds raise unmindful of the past or coming days who sing oh joy a new year is begun what happiness to look upon the sun oh what begetteth all this storm of bliss but death himself who crying solemnly even from the heart of sweet forgetfulness bids us rejoice lest pleasureless ye die within a little time must ye go by stretch forth your open hands and while ye live take all the gifts that death and life 
may give. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When the Hounds of Spring by Algernon Charles Swinburne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter When the Hounds of Spring When the Hounds of Spring are on winter's traces The mother of months in meadow or plain Fills the shadows and windy places With lisp of leaves and ripple of rain and the brown bright nightingale amorous is half assuaged for itilus for the thracian ships and the foreign faces the tongueless vigil and all the pain come with bows bent and with emptying of quivers maiden most perfect lady of light with a noise of winds and many rivers with a clamour of waters and with might bind on thy sandals o thou most fleet over the splendour and speed of thy feet for the faint east quickens the wan west shivers round the feet of the day and the feet of the night where shall we find her how shall we sing to her fold our hands round her knees and cling O oh, that man's heart were as fire, and could spring to her, Fire, or the strength of the streams that spring, For the stars and the winds are unto her, As raiment, as songs of the harp-player, For the risen stars and the fallen cling to her, And the south-west wind and the west wind sing. For winter's rains and ruins are over, and all the season of snows and sins, The days dividing lover and lover, The light that loses, the night that wins, And time remembered its grief forgotten, And frosts are slain, and flowers begotten, And in green underwood and cover Blossom by blossom the spring begins. The full streams feed on flower of rushes, Ripe grasses trammel a travelling foot. The faint fresh flame of the young year flushes From leaf to flower and flower to fruit. And fruit and leaf are as gold and fire, And the oat is heard above the lyre, And the hoofed heel of a satyr crushes The chestnut husk at the chestnut root. And pan by noon, and bacchus by night, Fleeter of foot than the fleet-foot kid, Follows with dancing and fills with delight The maenad and the basarid. And soft his lips that laugh and hide, The laughing leaves of the trees divide, And screen from seeing and leave in sight The god pursuing, the maiden hid. The ivy falls with the bacchanal's hair Over her eyebrows shading her eyes. The wild vine slipping down leaves bare Her bright breast shortening into sighs. The wild vine slips with the weight of its leaves, But the buried ivy catches and cleaves To the limbs that glitter, The feet that scare the wolf that follows, The fawn that flies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. March by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia March The cock is crowing, the stream is flowing, The small birds twitter, the lake doth glitter, The green field sleeps in the sun, The oldest and youngest are at work with the strongest, the cattle are grazing, their heads never raising, There are forty, feeding like one. Like an army defeated, the snow hath retreated, And now doth fare ill, on the top of the bare hill. The ploughboy is whooping, anon, anon, There's joy on the mountains, 
there's life in the fountains small clouds are sailing blue sky prevailing the rain is over and gone end of poem this recording is in the public domain spring the sweet spring by thomas nash from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by jason in panama spring the sweet spring spring the sweet spring is the year's pleasant king then blooms each thing then maids dance in a ring cold doth not sting the pretty birds do sing Cuckoo, jug jug, poo way, to wit a woo. The palm in May make country houses gay, lambs frisk and play, the shepherds pipe all day, and we hear a birds tune this merry lay. Cuckoo, jug jug, poo way, to wit a woo. The fields breathe sweet, the daisies kiss our feet, young lovers meet, old wives a sunning sit in every street these tunes our ears do greet cuckoo jug jug poo way to wit a woo spring the sweet spring thomas nash end of poem this recording is in the public domain return of spring from the french of pierre ronsard from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin return of spring god shield ye heralds of the spring ye faithful swallows fleet of wing hoops cuckoos nightingales turtles and every wilder bird that makes your hundred chirpings heard through the green woods and dales god shield ye easter daisies all fair roses buds and blossoms small and he who mursed the gore of ajax and narcis did print ye wild thyme anise balm and mint i welcome ye once more god shield ye bright embroidered train of butterflies that on the plain of each sweet herblet sip and ye new swarms of bees that go where the pink flowers and yellow grow to kiss them with your lip a hundred thousand times i call a hearty welcome on ye all this season how i love this merry din on every shore for winds and storms whose sullen roar forbade my steps to rove end of poem this recording is in the public domain spring by thomas gray from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by jason in panama spring lo where the rosy bosomed hours fair venus's train appear and wake the purple year the attic warbler pours her throat responsive to the cuckoo's note the untaught harmony of spring while whispering pleasure as they fly cool zephyrs through the clear blue sky their gathered fragrance fling where'er the oak's thick branches stretch a broader browner shade where'er the rude and moss-grown beech or canopies the glade beside some water's rushy brink with me the muse shall sit and think at ease reclined in rustic state how vain the ardour of the crowd how low how little are the proud how indigent the great still is the toiling hand of care the panting herds repose yet hark how through the peopled air the busy murmur glows the insect youth are on the wing eager to taste the honeyed spring and float amid the liquid noon some lightly o'er the current skim 
Some show their gaily gilded trim, Quick glancing to the sun. To contemplation's sober eye, Such is the race of man, And that they creep, and that they fly, Shall end where they began. Alike the busy and the gay, But flutter through life's little day, In fortune's varying colors dressed, Brushed by the hand of rough mischance, Or chilled by age, their airy dance they leave in dust to rest. Methinks I hear in accents low the sport of kind reply, Poor moralist, and what art thou? A solitary fly. Thy joys no glittering female meets, No hive hast thou of hoarded sweets, No painted plumage to display, On hasty wings thy youth is flown, Thy sun is set, thy spring is gone. We frolic while tis May. Thomas Gray End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summer Longings by Dennis Florence McCarthy From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Summer Longings Ah, my heart is weary waiting Waiting for the May Waiting for the pleasant rambles Where the fragrant hawthorn brambles With the woodbine alternating Send the dewy way. Ah, my heart is weary waiting, Waiting for the May. Ah, my heart is sick with longing, Longing for the May. Longing to escape from study, to the young face fair and ruddy, And the thousand charms belonging To the summer's day. Ah, my heart is sick with longing, Longing for the May. Ah, my heart is sore with sighing, Sighing for the May, Sighing for their sure returning, When the summer beams are burning, Hopes and flowers are dead or dying, All the winter lay. Ah, my heart is sore with sighing, Sighing for the May. Ah, my heart is pained with throbbing, Throbbing for the May. Throbbing for the seaside billows, Or the water-wooing willows, Where in laughing and in sobbing Glide the streams away. Ah, my heart, my heart is throbbing, Throbbing for the May. Waiting, sad, dejected, weary, Waiting for the May. Spring goes by with wasted warnings, Moonlit evenings, sunbright mornings. Summer comes yet dark and dreary, Life still ebbs away. Man is ever weary, weary, waiting for the May. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sweetly Breathing Vernal Air by Thomas Carew from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Sweetly Breathing Vernal Air Sweetly Breathing Vernal Air, that with kind warmth doth repair winter's ruins, from whose breast all the gums and spice of the east borrow their perfumes, whose eye gilds the morn and clears the sky, whose dishevelled tresses shed pearls upon the violet bed, on whose brow with calm smiles dressed the halcyon sits and builds her nest. Beauty, youth, and endless spring dwell upon thy rosy wing. Thou, if stormy Boreas throws down whole forests when he blows, with a pregnant flowery birth canst refresh the teeming earth if he nip the early bud if he blast what's fair or good if he scatter our choice flowers if he shake our halls or bowers if his rude breath threaten us thou canst stroke great aeolus and from him the grace obtain to bind him in an iron chain thomas carew End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Home Thoughts from Abroad by Robert Browning From the World's Best Poetry Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao Home Thoughts from Abroad 1 Oh, to be in England, now that April's there, And whoever wakes in England sees, some morning unaware, That the lowest boughs and the brushwood sheaf Round the elm-tree bowl are in tiny leaf, While the chaffinch sings on the orchard bough, In England, now! Two. And after April, when May follows, And the white-throat builds, and all the swallows, Hark, where my blossomed pear tree in the hedge leans to the field and scatters on the clover, blossoms and dewdrops at the bent spray's edge. That's the wise thrush, he sings each song twice over, lest you should think he never could recapture the first fine, careless rapture. And though the fields look rough with hoary dew, all will be gay when noontide wakes anew, the buttercups, the little children's dower, far brighter than this gaudy melon flower. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. May Morning by Celia Sexter From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia May Morning Warm, wild, rainy wind, blowing fitfully, Stirring dreamy breakers on the slumberous May sea, What shall fail to answer thee? What thing shall withstand the spell of thine enchantment, Flowing over sea and land? All along the swamp edge in the rain I go, All about my head thou the loosened locks dost blow, like the German goose girl in the fairy tale, I watch across the shining pool my flock of ducks that sail. Redly gleam the rose horse, dripping with the wet, fruit of sombre autumn, glowing crimson yet. Slender sorts of iris leaves cut the water clear, and light green creeps the tender grass, thick spreading far and near. Every last year's stalk is set with brown or golden studs. All the boughs of bayberry are thick with scented buds. Islanded in turfy velvet, where the ferns uncurl, lo, the large white duck's egg glimmers like a pearl. Softly sing the billows, rushing, whispering low. Freshly, oh deliciously, the warm wild wind doth blow. 
plaintive bleat of new-washed lambs comes faint from far away and clearly cry the little birds alert and blithe and gay o oh, happy happy morning o oh, dear familiar place o oh, warm sweet tears of heaven fast falling on my face o oh, well-remembered rainy wind blow all my care away that i may be a child again this blissful morn of may end of poem this recording is in the public domain song on may morning by john milton from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by jason in panama song on may morning now the bright morning star day's harbinger comes dancing from the east and leads with her the flowery may who from her green lap throws the yellow cowslip and the pale primrose hail bounteous may that doth inspire mirth and youth and warm desire woods and groves are of thy dressing hill and dale doth boast thy blessing thus we salute thee with our early song and welcome thee and wish thee long milton end of poem this recording is in the public domain spring in carolina by henry timrod from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by jason in panama as the narrator and lian yao as the dryad spring in carolina spring with that nameless pathos in the air which dwells with all things fair spring with her golden suns and silver rain is with us once again out in the lonely woods the jasmine burns its fragrant lamps and turns into a royal court with green festoons the banks of dark lagoons in the deep heart of every forest tree the blood is all aglee and there's a look about the leafless bowers as if they dreamed of flowers yet still on every side we trace the hand of winter in the land save where the maple reddens on the lawn flushed by the season's dawn or where like those strange semblances we find that age to childhood bind the elm puts on as if in nature's scorn the brown of autumn corn as yet the turf is dark although you know that not a span below a thousand germs are groping through the gloom and soon will burst their tomb in gardens you may note amid the dearth the crocus breaking earth and near the snowdrops tender white and green the violet in its screen but many gleams and shadows need must pass along the budding grass and weeks go by before the enamoured south shall kiss the rose's mouth still there's a sense of blossoms yet unborn in the sweet airs of morn one almost looks to see the very street grow purple at his feet at times a fragrant breeze comes floating by and brings you know not why a feeling as when eager crowds await before a palace gate some wondrous pageant and you scarce would start if from a beech's heart a blue-eyed dryad stepping forth should say behold me i am may end of poem this recording is in the public domain spring by ebenezer elliot from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao spring again the violet of our early days drinks beauteous azure from the golden sun and kindles into fragrance at his blaze 
the streams rejoice that winter's work is done talk of to-morrow's cowslips as they run wild apple thou art blushing into bloom thy leaves are coming snowy blossomed thorn wake buried lily spirit quit thy tomb and thou shade-loving hyacinth be born then haste sweet rose sweet woodbine him the morn whose dewdrop shall illume with pearly light each grassy blade that thick embattled stands from sea to sea while daisies infinite uplift in praise their glowing hands o'er every hill that under heaven expands End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Die Down, O Dismal Day by David Gray From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama Die Down, O Dismal Day Die Down, O Dismal Day, and Let Me Live and come, blue deeps, magnificently strewn with colored clouds, large, light, and fugitive, by upper winds through pompous motions blown. Now it is death in life, a vapor dense creeps round my window, till I cannot see the far snow-shining mountains, and the glens shagging the mountain tops. O oh God, make free this barren shackled earth, so deadly cold breathe gently forth thy spring till winter flies in rude amazement fearful and yet bold while she performs her customed charities i weigh the loaded hours till life is bare o oh god for one clear day a snowdrop and sweet air david gray end of poem this recording is in the public domain Morning in May by Geoffrey Chaucer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator And Thomas Peter as Arcit Morning in May From the Canterbury Pilgrims, the Knichtestale The busy Larke, messenger of Dye, Saluteth in here a song the more Greye and fiery Phoebus riseth up so brichte, that all the Orient laugheth of the lichte, and with his streamers dreeth in the graves the silver dropes hanging on the leaves, and our seat that is in the court royal with Theseus his queer principal is risen and looketh on the merry day, and for to dawn his observance to May, remembering on the point of his desire he on his courser starting as the fear is ridden into the fieldes him to playe out of the court where it a meal or twye and to the grove of which that i yo tolde by aventure his way he gan to holde to marken him a garland of the greves where it of woodbinde or hawthorn leves and laude he song against the sonne schene May, with alle thy flowers in the green, welcome be thou, well fair fresh a May. I hope that I some green get to May. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cuckoo Song by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Cuckoo Song Summer is he coming in, loo the sing cuckoo. Groweth it and bloweth mid and springeth the wood anew. Sing cuckoo, sing cuckoo no. Sing cuckoo, sing cuckoo, sing cuckoo no. I will bet the thafter long, loo thafter cover coo. Bullock's dealt as book of it as boot ye sing cuckoo. Coo 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 sing cuckoo no sing cuckoo sing cuckoo sing cuckoo no. Well sing a 
singest du kuku ne swicht du na wird nu es singest du kuku ne swicht du na wird nu end of poem this recording is in the public domain spring by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by thomas peter and craig franklin spring from in memoriam 82 dip down upon the northern shore o sweet new year delaying long Thou dost expect nature wrong, delaying long, delay no more. What stays thee from the clouded noons, thy sweetness from its proper place? Can trouble live with April days, or sadness in the summer moons? Bring Orcus, bring the foxglove spire, the little speedwell's darling blue, deep tulips dashed with fiery dew laburnums dropping wells of fire o thou new year delaying long delayest the sorrow in my blood that longs to burst a frozen bud and flood a fresher throat with song one hundred and fourteen now fades the last long streak of snow now burgeons every maze of quick about the flowering squares and thick by ashen roots the violets blow now rings the woodland loud and long the distance takes a lovelier hue and drowned in yonder living blue the lark becomes a sightless song now dance the lights on lawn and lea the flocks are whiter down the vale and milkier every milky sail on winding stream or distant sea where now the seamew pipes or dives in yonder greening gleam and fly the happy birds that change their sky to build and brood that live their lives from land to land and in my breast spring wakens too and my regret becomes an april violet and buds and blossoms like the rest end of poem this recording is in the public domain Betrothed Anew by Edmund Clarence Stedman From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Betrothed Anew The sunlight fills the trembling air, And balmy days their guerdons bring. The earth again is young and fair, And amorous with musky spring. The golden nurslings of the May In splendour strew the spangled green, And hues of tender beauty play Entangled where the willows lean. Mark how the rippled currents flow, What lustres on the meadows lie, And hark, the songsters come and go, And trill between the earth and sky. Who told us that the years had fled, Or born afar our blissful youth? Such joys are all about us spread, We know the whisper was not truth. The birds that break from grass and grove Sing every carol that they sung, When first our veins were rich with love, And May her mantle round us flung. O fresh lit dawn, immortal life, O earth's betrothal sweet and true, With whose delights our souls are rife, And I their vernal vows renew, then, darling, walk with me this morn, let your brown tresses drink its sheen. These violets within them worn, a floral fay shall make you queen. What though there comes a time of pain, when autumn winds forebode decay? The days of love are born again, that fabled time is far away. And never seen the land so fair as now, nor bird such notes to sing. Since first within your shining hair I wove the blossoms of the spring. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Plowman by Oliver Wendell Holmes From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Plowman Clear the brown path to meet his coulter's gleam. Lo, on he comes behind his smoking team With toil's bright dewdrops on his sunburnt brow, The lord of earth, the hero of the plow. First in the field before the reddening sun, Last in the shadows when the day is done, Line after line along the bursting sod Marks the broad acres where his feet have trod. Still where he treads the stubborn clods divide, The smooth, fresh furrow opens deep and wide. Matted and dense the tangled turf upheaves. Mellow and dark the ridgy cornfield cleaves, Up the steep hillside where the laboring train Slants the long track that scores the level plain. Through the moist valley, clogged with oozing clay, the patient convoy breaks its destined way. At every turn the loosening chains resound. The swinging plowshare circles glistening round. Till the wide field one billowy waste appears, And wearied hands unbind the panting steers. These are the hands whose sturdy labor brings the peasant's food. The golden pomp of kings, this is the page whose letters shall be seen changed by the sun to words of living green this is the scholar whose immortal pen spells the first lesson hunger taught to men these are the lines that heaven commanded toil shows on his deed the charter of the soil o oh, gracious mother whose benignant breast wakes us to life and lulls us all to rest how thy sweet features, kind to every clime, Mock with their smile the wrinkled front of time. We stain thy flowers, they blossom o'er the dead. We rend thy bosom, and it gives us bread. O'er the red field that trampling strife has torn, Waves the green plumage of thy tasseled corn. Our maddening conflicts scar thy fairest plain, Still thy soft answer is the growing grain. Yet, O oh, our mother, while uncounted charms Steal round our hearts in thine embracing arms, Let not our virtues in thy love decay, And thy fond sweetness waste our strength away. No, by these hills whose banners now displayed In blazing cohorts autumn has arrayed. By yon twin summits, on whose splintery crests the tossing hemlocks hold the eagle's nests. By these fair plains the mountain circles screens, and feeds with streamlets from its dark ravines. True to their home these faithful arms shall toil to crown with peace their own untainted soil, and, true to God, to freedom, to mankind, if her chained band-dogs faction shall unbind these stately forms that bending even now bowed their strong manhood to the humble plough shall rise erect the guardians of the land the same stern iron in the same right hand till o'er their hills the shouts of triumph run the sword has rescued what the ploughshare won Oliver Wendell Holmes End of poem This recording is in the public domain The Plough by Richard Hengist Horn From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Plough above yon sombre swell of land thou seest the dawn's grave orange hue with one pale streak like yellow sand and over that a vein of blue the air is cold above the woods all silent is the earth and sky except with his own lonely moods the blackbird holds a colloquy 
over the broad hill creeps a beam like hope that gilds a good man's brow and now ascends the nostril stream of stalwart horses come to plough ye rigid ploughmen bear in mind your labour is for future hours advance spare not nor look behind plough deep and straight with all your powers end of poem this recording is in the public domain they come the merry summer months by william motherwell from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by thomas peter they come the merry summer months they come the merry summer months of beauty song and flowers they come the glad summer months that bring thick leafiness to bowers up up my heart and walk abroad fling cark and care aside seek silent hills or rest thyself where peaceful waters glide or underneath the shadow vast of patriarchal tree scan through its leaves the cloudless sky in rapt tranquillity the grass is soft its velvet touch is grateful to the hand and like the kiss of maiden love the breeze is sweet and bland the daisy and the buttercup are nodding courteously it stirs their blood with kindest love to bless and welcome thee and mark how with thine own thin locks they now are silvery gray that blissful breeze is wantoning and whispering be gay there is no cloud that sails along the ocean of yon sky but hath its own winged mariners to give it melody thou seest their glittering fans outspread all gleaming like red gold and hark with shrill pipe musical their merry course they hold god bless them all those little ones who far above this earth can make a scoff of its mean joys and vent a nobler mirth but soft mine ear up caught a sound from yonder wood it came the spirit of the dim green glade did breathe its own glad name yes it is he the hermit bird that apart from all his kind slow spells his bees monotonous to the soft western wind cuckoo cuckoo he sings again his notes are void of art but simplest strains do soonest sound the deep founts of the heart good lord it is a gracious boon for thought crazed white like me to smell again the summer flowers beneath this summer tree to suck once more in every breath their little souls away and feed my fancy with fond dreams of youth's bright summer day when rushing forth like untamed colt the reckless truant boy wandered through green woods all day long a mighty heart of joy i'm sadder now i've had cause but oh i'm proud to think that each pure joy found loved of yore i yet delight to drink leaf blossom blade hill valley stream the calm unclouded sky still mingle music with my dreams as in the days gone by when summer's loveliness and light fall round me dark and cold i'll bear indeed life's heaviest curse a heart that hath waxed old end of poem this recording is in the public domain song of the summer winds by george darley from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox.org by lian yao song of the summer winds up the dale and down the bourne o'er the meadow swift we fly now we sing and now we mourn now we whistle now we sigh by the grassy fringed river through the murmuring reeds we sweep mid the lily leaves we quiver to their very hearts we creep 
now the maiden rose is blushing at the frolic things we say while aside her cheek we're rushing like some truant bees at play through the booming graves we rustle kissing every bud we pass as we did it in the bustle scarcely knowing how it was down the glen across the mountain o'er the yellow heath we roam whirling round about the fountain till its little breakers foam bending down the weeping willows while our vesper hymn we sigh then unto our rosy pillows on our weary wings we hie there of idleness's dreaming scarce from waking we refrain moments long as ages deeming till we're at our play again end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Drop of Dew by Andrew Marvel from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. A Drop of Dew See how the orient dew shed from the bosom of the morn into the blowing roses, yet careless of its mansion new for the clear region where t'was born. Round in itself encloses and in its little globe's extent frames as it can its native element how it the purple flower does slight scarce touching where it lies but gazing back upon the skies shines with a mournful light like its own tear because so long divided from the sphere restless it rolls and unsecure trembling lest it grow impure till the warm sun pities its pain and to the skies exhales it back again so the soul that drop that ray of the clear fountain of eternal day could it within the human flower be seen remembering still its former height shuns the sweet leaves and blossoms green and recollecting its own light does in its pure encircling thoughts express the greater heaven in a heaven less in how coy a figure wound every way it turns away so the world excluding round yet receiving in the day dark beneath but bright above here disdaining there in love how loose and easy hence to go how girt and ready to ascend moving but on a point below it all about does upwards bend such did the mana's sacred dew distill white and entire although congealed and chill congealed on earth but does dissolving run into the glories of the almighty sun andrew marvel end of poem this recording is in the public domain june by william cullen bryant from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by sonia june i gazed upon the glorious sky and the green mountains round and thought that when i came to lie at rest within the ground twere pleasant that in flowery june when brooks send up a cheerful tune and groves a cheerful sound the sexton's hand my grave to make the rich green mountain turf should break a cell within the frozen mould a coffin borne through sleet and icy clods above it rolled while fierce the tempests beat away i will not think of these blue be the sky and soft the breeze earth green beneath the feet and be the damp mould gently pressed into my narrow place of rest there through the long long summer hours the golden light should lie and thick young herbs and groups of flowers stand in their beauty by the oriole should build and tell his love tale close beside my cell the idle butterfly should rest him there and there be heard the housewife bee and humming bird and what if cheerful shouts at noon come from the village send or song of maids beneath the moon with fairy laughter blend and what if in the evening light
betrothed lovers walk in sight of my low monument i would the lovely scene around might know no sadder sight nor sound i know that i no more should see the season's glorious show nor would its brightness shine for me nor its wild music flow but if around my place of sleep the friends i love should come to weep they might not haste to go soft airs and song and light and bloom should keep them lingering by my tomb these to their softened hearts should bear the thought of what has been and speak of one who cannot share the gladness of the scene whose part in all the pomp that fills the circuit of the summer hills is that his grave is green and deeply would their hearts rejoice to hear again his living voice end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Story of a Summer Day by Alexander Hume From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Story of a Summer Day O perfect light, which shade away the darkness from the light, And set a ruler o'er the day, another o'er the night. Thy glory, when the day forth flies, more vividly doth appear than at midday unto our eyes the shining sun is clear the shadow of the earth anon removes and draws by while in the east when it is gone appears a clearer sky which soon perceive the little larks the lapwing and the snipe and tune their songs like nature's clerks o'er meadow muir and stripe our hemisphere is polished clean and lightened more and more while everything is clearly seen which seem it dim before except the glistering asters bright which all the night were clear offuscate with a greater light no longer do appear the golden globe incontinent sets up his shining head and o'er the earth and firmament displays his beams abread for joy the birds with bolden throats against his visage sheen take up their kindly music notes in woods and gardens green the dew upon the tender crops like pearless white and round or like to melted silver drops refreshes all the ground the misty reek the clouds of rain from tops of mountain scales clear are the highest hills and plain the vapors take the veils the ample heaven of fabric sure in cleanness does surpass the crystal and the silver pure or clearest polished glass the time so tranquil is and still that nowhere shall ye find save on a high and barren hill an air of peeping wind all trees and simples great and small that balmy leaf do bear than they were painted on a wall no more they move or stare calm is the deep and purple sea yea smoother than the sand the waves that weltering want to be are stable like the land so silent is the sessile air that every cry and call the hills and dales and forest fair again repeats them all the flourishes and fragrant flowers through phoebus fostering heat refreshed with dew and silver showers cast up an odor sweet the clogget busy humming bees that never think to drone on flowers and flourishes of trees collect their liquor brown the sun most like a speedy post with ardent course ascends the beauty of the heavenly host up to our zenith tends not guided by a phaeton not trained by a chair but by the high and holy one who does all wear empire the burning beams down from his face so fervently can beat 
that man and beast now seek a place to save them from the heat. The herds beneath some leafy tree amidst the flowers they lie. The stable ships upon the sea tend up their sails to dry. With gilded eyes and open wings, the cock his courage shows. With clasps of joy his breast he dings, and twenty times he crows. The dove with whistling wings so blue, the winds can fast collect. Her purple pens turn many a hue against the sun direct. Now noon is went, gone is midday, the heat does slake at last. The sun descends down west away, for three of clock is past. The rayons of the sun we see diminish in their strength. The shade of every tower and tree extended is in length. Great is the calm, for everywhere the wind is setting down. The reek throws right up in the air from every tower and town. The gloaming comes, the day is spent, the sun goes out of sight, and painted is the occident with purple sanguine bright. The scarlet nor the golden thread who would their beauty try are nothing like the color red and beauty of the sky. Our west horizon circular, from time the sun be set, is all with rubies as it were, or roses red or fret. What pleasure were to walk and see, and long a river clear, the perfect form of every tree within the deep appear. Oh, then it were a seemly thing, while all is still and calm, the praise of God to play and sing with cornet and with shalm. All laborers draw home at even, and can to others say, Thanks to the gracious God of heaven, which sent this summer day. Alexander Hume End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Knee Deep in June by James Whitcomb Riley from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Knee-deep in June. 1. Tell you what I like the best, long about knee-deep in June, about the time strawberries melts on the vines, so my afternoon like to just get out and rest, and not work at nothing else. 2. Orchard's where I'd rather be, need fence it in for me, just the whole sky overhead, and the whole earth underneath, sort of so's a man can breathe like he ought, and kinda has elbow room to carelessly sprawl out lengthways on the grass, with the shadows thick and soft as the kivers on the bed, mother fixes in the loft, always when there's company. 3. Just a sort of lazin' there, it's lazy, at your peak and peer through the waving leaves above, like a feller acts in love and don't know it, now don't care. Everything you hear and see got some sort of interest. Maybe find a bluebird's nest tucked up there conveniently for the boys that sap to be up some other apple tree. Watch the swallows scootin' past about as peer as you could ask. Hear the barb white rays and whiz with some other's whistle is. 4. Catch a shadow down below and look up to find the crow. Or a hawk away up there, apparently froze in the air. Hear the old hen squawk and squat over every chick she's got, sudden like. And she knows where that air hawk is, well as you. You just bet your life she do. Eyes a glittering like glass, wait until it makes a pass. 5. Pee Wee singing to express my opinion, second class. You chill here and more or less. Sap sucks getting down to biz, weeding out the lonesomeness. Mr. Blue Jay, full of sass in them baseball clothes of his, sporting round the orchard just like he owned the premises. Sun out in the fields can sizz. But flat on your back, I guess, in the shades where glory is. 
That's just what I like to do, steady for a year or two. 6. Plague, if they ain't something in work, that kinda goes again, my convictions. Long about here in June especially, under some old apple tree, just resting through and through, I could get along without nothing else at all to do, only just a wishing you was a getting there like me, and June was eternity. 7. Lay up there and try to see just how lazy you can be. Tumble round and songs your head in the clover bloom. A pull your straw hat across your eyes and peek through it at the skies. Thinking of old chums that's dead, maybe. Smiling back at you and betwixt the beautiful clouds of gold and white and blue. Month of man can really love. June, you know, I'm talking of. 8. March ain't never nothing new. April's altogether too brash for me. And May, I just abominate his promises. Little hints of sunshine and green around the timberland. A few blossoms and a few chippers and a sprout or two. Drop his sleep and it turns in for daylight and snows again. But when June comes, clear my throat with wild honey. Wrench my hair in the dew. And hold my coat. Whoop out loud and throw my hat. June wants me and I'm to spare. Spread them as shadows anywhere. I'll get down and wild there. And oblige to you at that. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad of Midsummer Days and Nights by William Ernest Henley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ballad of Midsummer Days and Nights With a ripple of leaves and a tinkle of streams, the full world rolls in a rhythm of praise, and the winds are one with the clouds and beams. Midsummer Days, Midsummer Days, the dusk grows vast, in a purple haze, where the west from a rapture of sunset writes. Faint stars their exquisite lamps upraise. Midsummer nights, oh, midsummer nights. The wood's green heart is a nest of dreams. The lush grass thickens and springs and sways. The wraith wheat rustles, the landscape gleams. Midsummer days, midsummer days. In the stilly fields, in the stilly ways, all secret shadows and mystic lights. Late lovers murmurous linger and gaze. Midsummer nights, oh, midsummer nights. There's a music of bells from the trampling teams. Wild skylarks hover, the gorses blaze. The rich ripe rose as with incense steams. Midsummer days, midsummer days. A soul from the honeysuckle strays, and the nightingale as from prophet heights. Sings to the earth of her million mays. Midsummer nights, oh, midsummer nights. Envoy. And it's oh for my dear, and the charm that stays. Midsummer days, midsummer days. It's oh for my love, and the dark that plights. Midsummer nights, oh, midsummer nights. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Invocation to Rain in Summer by William Cox Bennett From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Ya Invocation to Rain in Summer O oh, gentle, gentle summer rain, let not the silver lily pine, the drooping lily pine in vain to feel that dewy touch of thine, to drink thy freshness once again, O oh, gentle, gentle summer rain. In heat the landscape quivering lies, the cattle pant me the tree, through parching air and purple skies the earth looks up in vain for thee, for thee, for thee it looks in vain, O oh, gentle, gentle summer rain. 
Come thou, and brim the meadow streams, And soften all the hills with mist. O falling dew, from burning dreams, By thee shall herb and flower be kissed. And earth shall bless thee yet again, O gentle, gentle summer rain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rain in Summer by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Rain in Summer How beautiful is the rain! After the dust and heat, In the broad and fiery street, In the narrow lane, How beautiful is the rain! How it clatters along the roofs, like the tramp of hoofs, how it gushes and struggles out from the throat of the overflowing spout. Across the window pane it pours and pours, and swift and wide, with a muddy tide, like a river down the gutter roars the rain, the welcome rain. The sick man from his chamber looks at the twisted brooks. He can feel the cool breath of each little pool. His fevered brain grows calm again, and he breathes a blessing on the rain. From the neighboring school come the boys, with more than their wonted noise and commotion, and down the wet streets sail their mimic fleets, till the treacherous pool engulfs them in its whirling and turbulent ocean. In the country, on every side, where far and wide, like a leopard's tawny and spotted hide, stretches the plain to the dry grass and the drier grain how welcome is the rain in the furrowed land the toilsome and patient oxen stand lifting the yoke encumbered head with their dilated nostrils spread they silently inhale the clover scented gale and the vapors that arise from the well watered and smoking soil for this rest in the furrow after toil, their large and lustrous eyes seem to thank the Lord, more than man's spoken word. Near at hand, from under the sheltering trees, the farmer sees his pastures and his fields of grain, as they bend their tops to the numberless beating drops of the incessant rain. He counts it as no sin that he sees therein, only his own thrift and gain these and far more than these the poet sees he can behold aquarius old walking the fenceless fields of air and from each ample fold of the clouds about him rolled scattering everywhere the showery rain as the farmer scatters his grain he can behold things manifold that have not yet been wholly told, have not been wholly sung nor said, for his thought that never stops follows the water drops down to the graves of the dead, down through chasms and gulfs profound to the dreary fountain head of lakes and rivers underground, and sees them when the rain is done on the bridge of colours seven climbing up once more to heaven opposite the setting sun thus the seer with vision clear sees forms appear and disappear in the perpetual round of strange mysterious change from birth to death from death to birth from earth to heaven from heaven to earth till glimpses more sublime of things unseen before unto his wandering eyes reveal the universe as an immeasurable wheel turning forevermore in the rapid and rushing river of time. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Before the Rain by Thomas Bailey Aldridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia before the rain we knew it would rain for all the morn a spirit on slender ropes of mist 
was lowering its golden buckets down into the vapory amethyst of marshes and swamps and dismal fens scooping the dew that lay in the flowers dipping the jewels out of the sea to scatter them over the land in showers we knew it would rain for the poplars showed the white of their leaves the amber grain shrunk in the wind and the lightning now is tangled in tremulous skeins of rain end of poem this recording is in the public domain signs of rain by dr edward jenner from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by leanne yao signs of rain forty reasons for not accepting an invitation of a friend to make an excursion with him one the hollow winds begin to blow two the clouds look black the glass is low three the soot falls down the spaniels sleep four and spiders from their cobwebs peep five last night the sun went pale to bed six the moon in halos hid her head seven the boding shepherd heaves a sigh eight for sea a rainbow spans the sky nine the walls are damp the ditches smell ten closed is a pink-eyed pimpernel eleven hark how the chairs and tables crack twelve old betty's nerves are on the rack thirteen loud quacks the duck the peacocks cry fourteen the distant hills are seeming nigh fifteen how restless are the snorting swine sixteen the busy flies disturb the kine seventeen low o'er the grass the swallow wings eighteen the cricket too how sharp he sings nineteen puss on the hearth with velvet paws twenty sits wiping o'er her whiskered jaws twenty one through the clear streams the fishes rise twenty two and nimbly catch the incautious flies twenty three the glow-worms numerous and light twenty four illumed the dewy dell last night twenty five at dusk the squalid toad was seen twenty six hopping and crawling o'er the green twenty seven the whirling dust the wind obeys twenty eight and in the rapid eddy plays twenty nine the frog has changed his yellow vest thirty and in a russet coat is dressed thirty one though june the air is cold and still thirty two the mellow blackbird's voice is shrill thirty three my dog so altered in his taste thirty four quits mutton bones on grass to feast thirty five and see yon rooks how odd their flight thirty six they imitate the gliding kite thirty seven and seem precipitate to fall thirty eight as if they felt the piercing ball thirty nine twill surely rain i see with sorrow forty our jaunt must be put off to tomorrow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summer Storm by James Russell Lowell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Summer Storm Untremulous in the river clear Toward the sky's image Hangs the imaged bridge So still the air that I can hear The slender clarion of the unseen midge Out of the stillness With a gathering creep Like rising wind in leaves Which now decreases Now lulls Now swells And all the while increases The huddling trample of a drove of sheep 
tilts the loose planks, and then as gradually ceases in dust on the other side. Life's emblem deep, a confused noise between two silences, finding at last in dust precarious peace. On the wide marsh, the purple-blossomed grasses soak up the sunshine. Sleeps the brimming tide, save when the wedge-shaped wake in silence passes of some slow water rat, whose sinuous glide wavers the long green sedge's shade from side to side. But up the west, like a rock-shivered surge, climbs a great cloud edged with sun-whitened spray. Huge whirls of foam boil toppling o'er its verge, And falling still it seems, and yet it climbs away. Suddenly all the sky is hid as with the shutting of a lid. One by one great drops are falling, doubtful and slow. Down the pane they are crookedly crawling, and the wind breathes low. Slowly the circles widen on the river, widen and mingle one and all here and there the slenderer flowers shiver struck by an icy raindrop's fall now on the hills i hear the thunder mutter the wind is gathering in the west the upturned leaves first whiten and flutter then droop to a fitful rest up from the stream with sluggish flap struggles the gull and floats away Near and near rolls the thunder clap. We shall not see the sun go down today. Now leaps the wind on the sleepy marsh and tramples the grass with terrified feet. The startled river turns leaden and harsh. You can hear the quick heart of the tempest beat. Look, look, that livid flash! And instantly follows the rattling thunder as if some cloud crag split asunder, fell, splintering with a ruinous crash on the earth which crouches in silence under. And now a solid grey wall of rain shuts off the landscape mile by mile. For a breath's space I see the blue wood again, and, ere the next heartbeat, the wind-hurled pile that seemed but now a league aloof bursts crackling o'er the sun-parched roof against the windows the storm comes dashing through tattered foliage the hail tears crashing the blue lightning flashes the rapid hail clashes the white waves are tumbling and in one baffled roar like the toothless sea mumbling a rock bristled shore the thunder is rumbling and crashing and crumbling Will silence return nevermore? Hush! Still as death, the tempest holds his breath as from a sudden will. The rain stops short, but from the eaves you see it drop and hear it from the leaves. All is so bodenly still. Again now, now, again plashes the rain in heavy gouts. The crinkled lightning seems ever brightening, and loud and long again the thunder shouts his battle song. One quivering flash, one wildering crash, followed by silence, dead and dull, as if the cloud, let go, leapt bodily below to whelm the earth in one mad overthrow, and then a total lull. Gone, gone so soon. No more my half-crazed fancy there Can shape a giant in the air. No more I see his streaming hair, The writhing portent of his form. The pale and quiet moon Makes her calm forehead bare, And the last fragments of the storm, Like shattered rigging from a fight at sea, Silent and few, are drifting over me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. After the Rain by Thomas Bailey Aldrich. 
From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. After the Rain The rain has ceased, and in my room the sunshine pours an airy flood, and on the church's dizzy vein the ancient cross is bathed in blood. From out the dripping ivy leaves, antiquely carven, gray and high, a dormer, facing westward, looks upon the village like an eye. And now it glimmers in the sun, a square of gold, a disc, a speck, and in the belfry sits a dove with purple ripples on her neck. Thomas Bailey Aldrich End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Storm in the Distance by Paul Hamilton Hayne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin A Storm in the Distance I see the cloud-born squadrons of the gale, Their lines of rain like glittering spears depressed, while all the affrighted land grows darkly pale in flashing charge on earth's half-shielded breast. Sounds like the rush of trampling columns float from that fierce conflict, volleyed thunders peal, blent with the maddened wind's wild bugle note, the lightnings flash, the solid woodlands reel. Ha! Ah, many a foliaged guardian of the height Majestic pine or chestnut riven and bare falls in the rage of that aerial fight led by the prince of all the powers of air. Vast boughs like shattered banners hurtling fly down the thick tumult while, like emerald snow, millions of orphan leaves make wild the sky or drift in shuddering helplessness below. Still, still, the levelled lances of the rain at earth's half-shielded breast take glittering aim all space is rife with fury racked with pain earth bathed in vapour and heaven rent by flame at last the cloud battalions through long rifts of luminous mists retire the strife is done and earth once more her wounded beauty lifts to meet the healing kisses of the sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rain by Ebenezer Jones From the World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Rain more than the wind, more than the snow, more than the sunshine, I love rain. Whether it droppeth soft and low, whether it rusheth amain. Dark as the night it spreadeth its wings, slow and silently up on the hills. Then sweeps o'er the vale like a steed that springs from the grasp of a thousand wills. Swift sweeps under heaven the raven's flight, and the land and the lakes and the main lie belted beneath with steel-bright light, the light of the swift rushing rain. On evenings of summer, when sunlight is low, soft the rain falls from opal-hued skies, and the flowers the most delicate summer can show are not stirred by its gentle surprise. It falls on the pools, and no wrinkling it makes, but touching melts it, like the smile that sinks in the face of a dreamer, but breaks not the calm of his dream's happy while. The grass rises up as it falls on the meads, the bird softly as sings in his bower, and the circles of gnats circle on like winged seeds through the soft sunny lines of the shower. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dancing of the Air 
by Sir John Davies from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Dancing of the Air. And now behold your tender nurse, the air, and common neighbour that a runs around. How many pictures and impressions fair within her empty regions are there found, which to your senses dancing do propound? For what are breath, speech, echoes, music, winds, but dancings of the air in sundry kinds? For when you breathe, the air in order moves, now in, now out, in time and measure true. And when you speak, so well she dancing loves, that doubling oft and oft redoubling new, with thousand forms she doth herself endue. For all the words that from your lips repair, are naught but tricks and turnings of the air hence is her prattling daughter echo born that dances to all voices she can hear there is no sound so harsh that she doth scorn nor any time wherein she will forbear the airy pavement with her feet to wear and yet her hearing sense is nothing quick for after time she endeth every trick and thou sweet music dancing's only life the ear's sole happiness the air's best speech lodestone of fellowship charming rot of strife the soft mind's paradise the sick mind's leech with thine own tongue thou trees and stones canst teach that when the air doth dance her finest measure then art thou born the gods and men's sweet pleasure lastly where keep the winds their revelry their violent turnings and wild whirling haze but in the air's translucent gallery where she herself is turned a hundred ways while with these maskers wantonly she plays yet in this misrule they such rule embrace as two at once encumber not the place end of poem this recording is in the public domain Wicklow Winds from Wicklow by George Francis Savage Armstrong From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Wicklow Winds Yes, this is Wicklow round our feet, and o'er our heads its woodland smile Behold it, love the garden sweet, on playground of our stormy isle. Is it not fair, the leafy land, not boasting nature's sterner pride, voluptuous beauty scenes that stand by minds immortal, deified? Fair when the woodland strains and creaks, as loud the gathering whirlwinds blow, and through the smoke-like mists the peaks in warm autumnal purples glow. When madly tossed the bracken's plumes, Storm swept upon the seaward steep, As far below them foams and fumes, On beach and cliff the wrathful deep. Till cloud and tempest, creeping lower, Old Jorce's ridges swathe in night, And down through all his hollows pour The foaming torrents, swollen and white. Or when o'er powers courts leafless woods, With crests that down the tempest lean, Bend braving winter's fiercest moods, the pines in all their wealth of green. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bysshe Shelley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ode to the West Wind 1. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, Thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven, Like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, Yellow and black and pale and hectic red, Pestilence-stricken multitudes, O thou, who charioteth to their dark wintry bed the winged seeds, 
where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow her clarion o'er the dreaming earth, and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, with living hues and odors, plain and hill. Wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here, oh, here. Two. Thou on whose stream, mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean, angels of rain and lightning. There are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge, like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce menad, even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm. Thou dirge of the dying year, to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre, vaulted with all thy congregated might of vapours. Remove solid atmosphere, black rain, and fire, and hail, will burst. O oh, hear! 3. Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean, where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle in Bay's Bay, and saw in sleep old palaces and towers, quivering within the waves in tenser day, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet the sense faints picturing them. Thou, for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while, far below, the sea blooms, and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean, know thy voice, and suddenly grow grey with fear, and tremble and despoil themselves. O oh, hear! For, if I were a dead leaf thou mightest bear, if I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power and share the impulse of thy strength, only less free than thou, O oh, uncontrollable. If even I were as in my boyhood, and could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven as then, when to outstrip thy sky speed scarce seemed a vision, I would ne'er have striven as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need. O oh, Lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life. I bleed. A heavy weight of hours has chained and bowed, one too like thee, tameless and swift and proud. 5. Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou spirit fierce, my spirit, be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe, like withered leaves, to quicken a new birth, and, by the incantation of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind. Be through my lips to unawakened earth the trumpet of a prophecy. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cloud Chorus by Aristophanes Translated from the Greek by Andrew Lang From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as the narrator Thomas Peter as Socrates And Lian Yao as the Clouds
The Cloud Chorus From the Clouds Socrates Speaks Hither, come hither, ye clouds renowned, and unveil yourselves here. Come, though ye dwell on the sacred crests of Olympian snow, or whether ye dance with the Nereid choir in the gardens clear, or whether your golden urns are dipped in Nile's overflow, or whether ye dwell by Meotis mere, or the snows of Mimas, arise, appear, and hearken to us, and accept our gifts ere ye rise and go. The Clouds Sing Immortal clouds from the echoing shore Of the father of streams from the sounding sea, Dewy and fleet, let us rise and soar, Dewy and gleaming and fleet are we. Let us look on the tree-clad mountain crest, On the sacred earth where the fruits rejoice, On the waters that murmur east and west, On the tumbling sea where there's moaning voice. For in wearied glitters the eye of the air, and the bright rays gleam. Then cast we our shadows of mist and fair in our deathless shapes to glance everywhere. From the height of the heaven on the land and air, and the ocean stream. Let us on, ye maidens that bring the rain, let us gaze on palaces citadel. In the country of sea crops fair and dear, the mystic land of the holy soul, where the rites unspoken securely dwell, and the gifts of the gods that know not stain, and a people of mortals that know not fear, for the temples tall, and the statues fair, and the feasts of the gods are holiest there. The feasts of immortals, the chaplets of flowers, and the bromian mirth at the coming of spring, and the musical voices that fill the hours, and the dancing feet of the maids that sing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cloud by Percy Bysshe Shelley From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao the cloud i bring fresh showers for the thirsting flowers from the seas and the streams i bear light shade for the leaves when laid in their noonday dreams from my wings are shaken the dews that waken the sweet buds every one when rocked to rest on their mother's breast as she dances about the sun i wield the flail of the lashing hail and whiten the green plains under and then again I dissolve it in rain, and laugh as I pass in thunder. I sift the snow on the mountains below, and their great pines groan aghast, and all the night tis my pillow white, while I sleep in the arms of the blast. Sublime on the towers of my skyey bowers, lightning my pilot sits, in a cavern under is fettered the thunder, it struggles and howls by fits. Of earth and ocean with gentle motion this pilot is guiding me, lured by the love of the genii that move in the depths of the purple sea. Over the rills and the crags and the hills, over the lakes and plains, wherever he dream under mountain or stream, the spirit he loves remains. And I all the while bask in heaven's blue smile, while he is dissolving in rains. The sanguine sunrise, with his meteor eyes and his burning plumes outspread, leaps on the back of my sailing rack when the morning star shines dead. As on the jag of a mountain crag, which an earthquake rocks and swings, an eagle alit one moment may sit in the light of its golden wings, and when sunset may breathe from the lit sea beneath its ardours of rest and of love, and the crimson pall of eve may fall from the depth of heaven above. With wings folded I rest in mine airy nest, as still as a brooding dove. 
that orbed maiden with white fire laden whom mortals call the moon glides glimmering o'er my, my fleece-like floor by the midnight breezes strewn and wherever the beat of her unseen feet which only the angels hear may have broken the roof of my tent's thin roof the stars peep behind her and peer and i laugh to see them whirl and flee like a swarm of golden bees when i widen the rent in my wind-built tent till the calm rivers lakes and seas like strips of the sky fallen through me on high are each paid with the moon and these i bind the sun's throne with a burning zone and the moon's with a girdle of pearl the volcanoes are dim and the stars reel and swim when the whirlwind my banner unfurl from cape to cape with a bridge-like shape over a torrent sea sunbeam proof i hang like a roof the mountains its columns be the triumphal arch through which i march with hurricane fire and snow when the powers of the air are chained to my chair is the million coloured bow the sphere fire above its soft colours wove while the moist earth was laughing below i am the daughter of the earth and water and the nursling of the sky i pass through the pores of the ocean and shores i change but i cannot die for after the rain when with never a stain the pavilion of heaven is bare and the winds and sunbeams with their convex gleams build up the blue dome of air i silently laugh at my own cenotaph and out of the caverns of rain like a child from the womb like a ghost from the tomb i rise and upbuild it again end of poem this recording is in the public domain summer moods by john clare from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by sonia summer moods i love at eventide to walk alone down narrow glens overhung with dewy thorn where from the long grass underneath the snail jet black creeps out and sprouts his timid horn i love to muse over meadows newly mown where withering grass perfumes the sultry air where bees surge round with sad and weary drone in vain for flowers that bloomed but newly there while in the juicy corn the hidden quail cries wet my foot and hid as thoughts unborn the fairy-like and seldom seen land rail utters quick Crick, like voices underground right glad to meet the evening's dewy veil and see the light fade into gloom around end of poem this recording is in the public domain in praise of angling by sir henry wotton from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter in praise of angling quivering fears heart-tearing cares anxious sighs untimely tears fly fly to courts fly to fond worldling sports where strained sardonic smiles are glozing still and grief is forced to laugh against her will where mirth's but mummery and sorrows only real be fly from our country pastimes fly sad troops of human misery come serene looks clear as the crystal brooks or the pure azured heaven that smiles to see the rich attendance on our poverty peace and a secure mind which all men seek we only find abused mortals did you know where joy heart's ease and comforts grow you scorn proud towers and seek them in these bowers 
where winds sometimes our woods perhaps may shake but blustering care could never tempest make nor murmurs e'er come nigh us saving of fountains that glide by us here's no fantastic mask or dance but of our kids that frisk and prance nor wars are seen unless upon the green two harmless lambs are butting one the other which done both bleeding run each to his mother and wounds are never found save what the ploughshare gives the ground here are no entrapping baits to hasten to too hasty fates unless it be the fond credulity of silly fish which worldling-like still look upon the bait but never on the hook nor envy less among the birds for price of their sweet song go let the diving negro seek for gems hid in some forlorn creek we all pearls scorn save what the dewy morn congeals upon each little spire of grass which careless shepherds beat down as they pass and gold ne'er here appears save what the yellow ceres bears blessed silent groves oh may you be forever mirth's best nursery may pure contents forever pitch their tents upon these downs these meads these rocks these mountains and peace still slumber by these purling fountains which we may every year meet when we come a-fishing here end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Angler's Wish by Isaac Walton From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Angler's Wish I in these flowery meads would be, These crystal streams should solace me, To whose harmonious bubbling noise I, with my angle, would rejoice sit here and see the turtle dove court his chaste mate to acts of love or on that bank feel the west wind breathe health and plenty please my mind to see sweet dewdrops kiss these flowers and then washed off by april showers here hear my kenna sing a song there see a blackbird feed her young or a laverock build her nest here give my weary spirits rest and raise my low-pitched thoughts above earth or what poor mortals love thus free from lawsuits and the noise of princes courts i would rejoice or with my brian and a book loiter long days near shawford brook there sit by him and eat my meat there see the sun both rise and set there bid good morning to next day there meditate my time away and angle on and beg to have a quiet passage to a welcome grave isaac walton end of poem this recording is in the public domain the angler by john chalkhill from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. The Angler. Oh, the gallant fisher's life! It is the best of any. Tis full of pleasure, void of strife, and tis beloved by many. Other joys are but toys. Only this lawful is, for our skill breeds no ill but content and pleasure. When we please to walk abroad for our recreation, in the fields is our abode full of delectation. Where in a brook, with a hook, or a lake fish we take, there we sit for a bit, till we fish entangle. We have gentles in a horn, we have paste and worms too, we can watch both night and morn, suffer rain and storms too. 
none do hear used to swear oaths do fray fish away we sit still watch our quill fishers must not wrangle if the sun's excessive heat makes our bodies swelter to an osier hedge we get for a friendly shelter where in a dyke perch or pike roach or dace we do chase bleak or gudgeon without grudging we are still contented or we sometimes pass an hour under a green willow that defends us from a shower making earth our pillow where we may think and pray before death stops our breath other joys are but toys and to be lamented end of poem this recording is in the public domain swimming from the two foscari by lord byron from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by jason in panama swimming from the two foscari how many a time have i cloven with arms still lustier breast more daring the wave all roughened with a swimmer's stroke flinging the billows back from my drenched hair and laughing from my lips the audacious brine which kissed it like a wine cup rising o'er the waves as they arose and prouder still the loftier they uplifted me and oft in wantonness of spirit plunging down into their green and glassy gulfs and making my way to shells and seaweed all unseen by those above till they waxed fearful then returning with my grasp full of such tokens as showed that i had searched the deep exulting with a far dashing stroke and drawing deep the long suspended breath again i spurned the foam which broke around me and pursued my track like a seabird i was a boy then lord byron end of poem this recording is in the public domain